Hi, Zach. Hello? Yo, can you hear me? I can indeed. Awesome. Give me just a second here. I'm just going to Sure. double check to make sure my video is all right. Yeah, video is very good. Awesome. I got one of those fancy uh, live stream cameras. Oh, nice. So Um, I, I, there's just like a nice little webcam. It's been very helpful. Um, yeah, give me just a second. I should be able to share screen, but we'll hold off for just a moment here. no, that's perfect. So are we live streaming right now? Yeah, we are. Ah, that sounds about right. All right. I was hoping to be able to catch you a few minutes early, but that's all right. I'm I'm just about ready. Oh, no, that's perfect. Um, maybe for like for those who may not know much about you, um, how about you just like give an introduction to yourself? Of course, I, I need to stall for time here for a second anyway. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Zach Wright. I, uh, I am a return missionary. I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, new to this whole apologetics thing, admittedly, but I've been working a lot with FAIR recently. I've done a podcast with them. It's about 10 episodes, kind of talking about critical thinking skills. I've done a response to the Gospel for Mormons, as Robert has, And one of the things we hope to be able to do in the future, I don't know if you're still on for that, but Oh yeah, I'm totally on for that. all right, J just let me know, because March is, March is going to be a lot better for me. Just February has been swamped. Um, basically, though, I, I, I served during the time of COVID, and during the time of COVID, it kind of forced me to be online more, and so I ended up running into a lot of antagonistic material to the church. And also serving in North Carolina, everyone and their mom has an opinion about the church. Um, lots of a uh, very, very, very Protestant area. And so they had lots of opinions about Joseph Smith and whether or not there even needed to be a restoration. And so I was kind of forced to come to grips with a lot of these issues more so than I think a lot of people needed to. Um, at, at least during the time. So. I consider myself very fortunate to have run into people like Robert, but also a couple of other really smart people who I'll be referencing this evening, uh, including but not limited to Don Bradley, Jennifer Roach. I've I've um I've been under their tutelage, so to speak, albeit indirectly, for several years now. And I feel as if one of the things I I hope to be able to do is just help people build and maintain faith in Jesus Christ and help answer questions that people may sometimes have about LDS theology and history, but that's kind of the long and short of it. Um, and also there's a new project you're working with on fair. Oh yeah. Um, want, want to plug that as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll plug that. It's, um, it's a new podcast fair is doing called me, my shelf and I. It's uh, basically we're, we're exploring a couple different topics in conjunction with the come follow me this year for book of Mormon. And we're, we're, I'm super excited for it. I get to hang out with Jennifer Roach and Sarah Allen, and we get to nerd out. I get to make jokes. Rock puns may or may not be involved as we are studying the seer stone. Um, I am the main culprit of that, as you may imagine. But I, uh, that's that's To certainly be, been to a be lot fair, of fun. like rock and geology jokes, they rock. So, you know, as Yes. long as you're like working under pressure. <laughs> that was good. I like that. Um, I think I've stalled enough, though, because I think we're just about ready to get started. Give me No, just that's a moment. fine. Uh, I'll let you be able to share your screen. Um, Yeah. and just So. like, so we're, uh, because we talked about Durban, we should do that kind of a video response, your, um, interaction, maybe like say the 23rd or the 24th, but Um, we can, we can hash that out. we'll hash that out later to be sure. Tonight, Yeah. though, we are talking about a very different critic of the church with a very different... A uh, set of presuppositions, so to say, so, so to speak. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about Bill Real, and this is my. I'm working right now on a response to Bill Real's The Mormon Paradox, and I'll I'll get into a little bit kind of what's going on there because you're walking into this a little bit blind, Robert. Right? I don't keep up with Bill Real. I have zero interest or zero respect for him. Basically, I th there's a part of me that that's not. Um, surprised about that i um now granted 
we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about kind of Bill's background here for a second. But one of the things I, I hope to be able to do is because he's going to bring a couple of things up, but he actually references a couple of things that you've actually directly addressed either in your blog posts or in your books. And so I might ask for your opinion about a couple of different things. We can kind of hash this out. But the long and the short of it is, is that I um, I think his content's worth addressing, if for nothing else, just to kind of figure out kind of the the long and the short of what a lot of critics of the church try to say and how a lot of what they say can sometimes be somewhat misleading or not be nearly as strong as uh, maybe a more faithful response would be. So who is Bill Real? So from what I was able to ascertain, he was a convert to the church. He was called as a bishop. He was a volunteer with FAIR for a number of years, wherein he founded a, an organization called Mormon Discussion Inc., wherein a number of podcasts have been published. Um, he was excommunicated in December of 2018 after posting a video discussing instances where Elder Holland was allegedly dishonest. Said video has already been addressed by a couple of other platforms, so we won't go too deeply into that. I, I want to say LDS Living did an article responding to it, and I thought it was rather good. So I, I'll just kind of make a plug in there. Um, this is kind of a little spiel that he wrote down. Basically, it's you, you can take a look at that if you'd like. But basically, he um, the, the reason why he claims he's no longer part of the church is that he wanted the church to be true, but the church had a truth crisis. That, that's, a ter that's a term I've heard thrown around kind of recently. I want to say Jeremy Runnels says something kind of similar, so I'm not sure if he's co-opting that at all, but I'm not quite sure. Um, so Bill, when he was excommunicated, wanted to compile a list of reasons why the church was false, and he solicited the help of the ex-Mormon subreddit to do this. Here is the post wherein he does this. Um, this was maybe a couple of years ago, if memory serves, but... Um, Eventually, and this is a rather recent development, he actually ended up posting this a little, maybe a year or so ago, and he posted three different sources. One of them was, uh, there There were a couple of other ones, they were significantly shorter, but the longest one I found was what he called the Mormon Paradox, a list of inconsistencies that challenge faith. And I'll go ahead and read this. Uh, this list was a collection of strange, absurd, or improbable beliefs that one must hold in order for Mormonism to be true. This list was designed to help the believers sense just how absurd belief is and help them sense their inner intuition in regards to how much crazy is one supposed to believe before the brain finally tells the person, what if it isn't true? So basically, the the, the purpose of said uh list here is rather abundantly clear. He wants to be able to help the believer find reasons to understand why belief is, as he says, strange, absurd, or improbable. Um, so this is his cumulative list. Uh, he is a list of 122 complaints. It's the, it's rather long. Uh, as he says, uh, hold on, sorry, I've got my, uh, I've got my screen here in a way I can't quite read. Um, there we are. So he says that each item is sourced to links where the reader can investigate further. These are, as I said before, significant absurdities one must believe to accept Mormonism. And he, he also states that faithful explanations are riddled with conjecture or are otherwise irrational. This is, these are all, for the most part, coming from direct quotes. I'm happy to cite sources for that. But one of the things he made abundantly clear is that if there is anything missing, that we are to leave suggestions and comments and just kind of let him know. So I, I don't know if Bill will care to watch this, but these are my suggestions. These are my thoughts on his entire list. So let's run, let's run some of the numbers here. Are there really 122 items on this list? I think this is kind of, this is interesting. So the answer is yes and no. In reality, there is a lot of repetition. I counted the same complaints being mentioned multiple times. Um, I found about half of them. I'll, I think I have the exact number here. Half of them are basically just repeats of him saying the same thing. So we have a couple of examples of that. And you can kind of gloss over this. So we have complaint number 10. God was okay with marrying modern prophet uh, with modern prophets marrying and having sex with children as young as 14. 
that it was God's idea, even as Joseph supposedly enacts polygamy with deeply unhealthy and unethical behavior within it. So I, I see you're smirking a little bit over there, and we're going to get the chance to explore some of these claims here in a bit. Right now, I'm just trying to get um, trying to demonstrate how there's a lot of repetition. So, for example, you know, over 50 items later, you can read this. It's pretty much he says pretty much the exact same thing that the eldest church is the purveyor of God's moral laws, or was proper marriage, and their sordid history of polygamy, polyandry, young brides, and rampant sexual abuse. And you might be able to argue that this is at least just a little bit different. It's like that meme where it's a, hey, can I copy your homework? Okay, yeah, but change it up a little bit so that nobody will know. I, I don't know what's what's going on there. We'll, we'll kind of explore some of that here in a second. But as you can see, this is pretty much the same complaint, all things considered. Um, other examples include um, anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon names animals that were in Joseph Smith's contemporary landscape, but not but 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 not believed by all non-Mormon experts to have existed in Book of Mormon times. It appears anachronistic. Complaint 69. Again, almost like 50 items later, he says the exact same thing about animals. All right, so this is another one. God would instruct Joseph Smith to use the seer stone. Again, God is using Joseph Smith's seer stone. Um, this is, this is another one in complaint number 23, this religion attempts to control the underwear you wear and the decibel at which you laugh and complaint 81, the religion requires complete devotion and control, even down to the number of earrings, underwear selection, dietary restrictions, loudness of laughing, etc. This will be the last one, I think. And this one's kind of interesting. He, he talks about the Jaredite vessels a couple times throughout here and that the Jaredites build multiple barges carrying animal life and food and seeds and made it across the ocean without regard for what it takes to make such a voyage and care for the items aboard the vessel. But instead of grouping this in, he actually just ends up referencing previous complaints later on. So complaint 104 is just like, take a look at number three. So my immediate question at that point becomes, why is it that he can't put complaint 104 and consolidate it into complaint number three? That sort of thing. And so uh, examples can be multiplied, but as I was looking over it, I, I tried to see if I could figure out if I could consolidate it. It's really not 122. It's about 50 different topics, give or take. Now, granted, he um he would probably need to like create a, like a couple of different bullet points within some of these because he there are a couple of items to explore and fair enough but um but the problem i found is that I, I i wonder if that number is somewhat misleading because when he's citing 122 full complaints people might hear that number and go ah the church isn't true and it, it's kind of one of those gish gallop things wherein I, I i worry that the number itself might be intimidating to people and believers of the church but if you actually go and explore, it, there's a lot of repetition and there aren't nearly as many complaints as he might be trying to demonstrate that there are. Now, I could be misreading this. I, it could be that he just forgot that he would mentioned that sort of thing and he just kind of repeats himself over and over again. My, I, I, I honestly don't know. I can't speak for Bill. But I, I can say that a possible side effect that I would be concerned about if I was in Bill's position is that I am overestimating or trying to overrepresent quote unquote problems within the church. Um I need water. Hold on a second. But I, I think that's um that's kind of what I wanted to talk about there. Any questions so far? Um no, that's pretty um self-explanatory but maybe for like uh those who don't know what a gish gallop is maybe if you were to like maybe uh, briefly discuss that yeah so a gish gallop is a is a fallacy which explain it's also referred to as the long list fallacy it is a um it is a fallacy that's defined as i want to say it's it's named after a young earth creationist by the name of Dwayne gish who was characterized by his um his debate tactics wherein he would list off a bunch of different complaints Usually most of them weren't super great by by most kind of old earth perspectives. And it, they were rather easily debunked, but by just spewing these this long list of complaints, he was able to make points and not and then for time delineated debates, people would never be able to respond to all of them. And then he, of course, would be able to point back and say, 
well, they didn't respond to X, Y, and Z things. And so that's a, that's a debate. That's a debate thing. And um, sometimes it's called spewing as a result in, in debate circles, but it's a fallacy in the sense that it can, it, um, first off, it doesn't do you much good just to create premises that are almost designed to fail. And also we as human beings can often get overwhelmed by a bunch of new information we're not familiar with. And so the strength of the claims is often not found within like the premises of the arguments themselves, like how strong each complaint is, but rather it's just this long list and then we as people get nervous, that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I talk about that a little bit. I actually went into logical fallacies in one of the videos I made for FAIR, so you can look that up. It's just uh, logical fallacies on FAIR's website. Uh, if you'd like, you can put a plug into it. It's um, just kind of a list of different logical fallacies I've found. So there's a list here where Bill's entire collection of sources is about 154. This is including repeats. Um, but the question then becomes, what kind of sources is he pulling from? You actually find that the most, the, the he actually cites himself more often than he cites other people. So he'll cite his own podcast stuff. Sometimes he just won't even put any sources in there, which is a direct contradiction to what he said about each item actually having a linked source where people can look more, look, look more deeply into it. I am, um, but a lot of the time he ends up setting other podcast websites and blogs, including Mormon Think, Mormon Stories, and Mormon Stories and MRM. Uh, that's Mormon. That's Mormon Research Ministry. For the, for those who don't know, they um. They're more of an evangelical flavor of anti, but he ends up citing them relatively often. Uh, if memory serves, um, he actually also ends up citing, uh, I'm trying to blank on his name, uh, Beggar's Bread, Robert, help me out here. Fred Anson. Fred Anson? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so he ends up citing him as well. I, uh, I th That's just another one. He does end up citing a couple of different apologetic websites, so Fair and Scripture Central. I don't remember them being cited very often. Uh, but, and he'll also take time to like cite specific scriptures and like put study, like primary sources, historical, like J Joseph Smith papers, that sort of thing. Again, that is comparatively less often as we'll see. He also has no issue citing Wikipedia and social media as authoritative sources, which I, I personally have a bit of a hard time with. But um, I actually developed a pie chart because I like pie charts. So, you can see that about a third of the time he is referencing his own podcasts and his own stuff. And there's actually a number of links that, and not a lot, but there are a couple of links I just couldn't get access to because either the link was bad and I couldn't fix it through the internet archive. And so I, I, I really have no way to respond to them. And so I, I'm not quite sure how I would go about fixing that. And, and it should be known, like, uh, Bill Real is not peer-reviewed, he's not an academic, and none of these stuff has been peer-reviewed as well. Uh, Absolutely. Just throwing, that, just throwing that out there for the whole uh, interpreter is not peer-reviewed or anything like that. Uh, yes. Come back, yeah. And so that, that actually comes up a little bit later, because he, he does cite a couple of actual peer-reviewed university stuff, usually from BYU, and, but that's only like, a, as you can see, it's a small, small percentage, 3.2%. Compared to the 33% wherein he is just citing himself and his podcast episodes, blog articles he's written, that sort of thing. Um, granted, he does cite primary sources like scriptures, but even then he is citing secondary sources and himself, as well as Wikipedia and social media. He's citing secondary social media, unpeer reviewed, um, just people chatting on the internet as being some kind of authoritative you know, proof that the stuff the scripture says isn't true or that, that sort of thing. Um, I, I got a kick out of the idea that he cites Wikipedia about three times the amount he cites peer reviewed scholarship and he cites himself about twice as often as he cites actual primary sources. And the fact that he uses Reddit at all in any kind of authoritative way, besides maybe anecdote stuff um, is beyond me. If, if you're able to find the stuff on Reddit, there are obviously going to be better sources for it. And if you're going to find, literally Wikipedia most of the time is good about citing their actual sources. So if you want to do, if you want to use Wikipedia, use it just to track down the actual scholarship instead of just going directly to secondary sources. It, it doesn't seem, if, 
if I tried to cite sources the way that Bill is trying to cite sources here, if I was writing a psychology paper, I would I would probably get booted from the class. I don't know my professor would be super upset with me because the way that he structured sources here is just not it doesn't hold up to the academic part. Now, granted, so we have that. Now, the sources by themselves don't necessarily prove whether something is true or not. Like, I can just cite, like, three different sources, um, all three of them being, like, different, of a different caliber, and that, that might, like, change some of these numbers. But so far, I, I, I at least in terms of how he structured his sources, I, I don't find myself super impressed with it. And the response I've tried to do so far, this is, these are the sources I tried to cite. Um, I try to be a little bit more fair and balanced about it. You'll notice that I, I try to use a lot more primary sources. I use more peer-reviewed and university articles and study Bibles. I use blogs such as yours because you are in fact a trained theologian. I, I'll use Ben Spackman's too because he's, you know, a historian. He's great. I am um, lots of, lots of stuff like that. And I'll also use fair um, fair articles, interviews, because these are all people who have academic credentials to help kind of back up what they're saying and also have a bit more of a peer-reviewed stuff. I, I cite the interpreter uh, as well. Uh, people might notice I am citing social media. Again, I am not using it as a way to kind of prove my point solidly. I'm using it as anecdote stuff, because, mostly because the way that Bill has set up his arguments, there's no other way to talk about it then through anecdotal evidence. So for instance, um, one of his complaints is he talks about uh, Grant Palmer's interview with an alleged 70 that uh, proves that, wherein I have to go back through people hypothetically claiming that they've talked with alleged 70 or they talked with Grant Palmer, and I can't really verify that information. And so I have to inform my viewers that, listen, this is anecdotal stuff. I'm not sure how accurate this is, but the general impression can be received that, first off, this um, Grant, Palmer, Grant Palmer might not be fully representing the story. He might not accurately be showing everything. And certainly Grant Palmer has received a lot of criticism by um, people with academic credentials and people who know a little bit more about certain t issues. So I, th that's not surprising. But I, the short answer is I do use social media, but I, I don't use it nearly as much as Bill does. And when I try to use it, I try to make it clear to my whoever might be listening to or reading what I'm saying that that's accurate. I do, of course, cite uh, FAIR sometimes. That's kind of um, that 13%. And a lot of the, sometimes I do cite myself, but that's mostly because he ends up repeating his claims. I'm like, all right, just go back to my re previous response here. So uh, it's also worth noting, I think I mentioned Bill had like maybe 152 sources I think I've more than doubled that in terms of the sources I bring and the stuff I've brought into this. So I'm going to see if I can get this published with FAIR here soon, but we'll, we'll have to see. But here's where the rubber meets the road, because I don't believe Bill, I, I don't believe Bill's research is really up to, is up to snuff with a lot of these issues. Um, the four biggest things I was able to find is that Bill assumes certain things about the texts that he's analyzing or the people he's researching without justifying those assumptions. He has incomplete information where he cites correct stuff per se, but he's not citing the whole story or is giving a very biased or kind of a skewed interpretation of the text. And he's not accounting for like modern scholarship, for example, or other sources from that time. Uh, there are also a couple times where Bill just didn't read his sources, where Bill cites sources that say the exact opposite of what he's trying to say. And also just fallacious reasoning. We'll go through examples of just about every single one of these. Um, so I think we'll just kind of explore some of these issues. So the, the topic that I thought was interesting, he cited polygamy at the most amount of times and the most amount of complaints. So these are just kind of a sampler platter of the different stuff that he brings up about polygamy. Joseph Marion has sexual relations with women as young as 14 years old. Uh, Joseph was sealed to women who were already married in spite of DNC 32, as he claims. Uh, Joseph sealed himself to other women before Emma. Uh, Joseph Smith would bully or pressure women into marrying him, and polygamy was promised to never be taken from the earth. So we're going to go over just about all of these. And albeit, when, when I go over this stuff, much, much more can be said. 
And I, I, I certainly don't pretend that in the, a lot of time that we have together, we'll be able to go over everything. But I, I do think that there are some good answers that can be explained um, in a way that people can understand, but also don't necessarily have to exclude the possibility of faith. So sure. we'll, we'll just kind of... Uh, just because I have to do this in case my boss watches, uh, we have a bunch of articles and primary resource sources on the Mormon Orc website dealing with polygamy among other topics. So definitely check that out, but I'll let you continue. Yeah, I, I also cite Mormon or very often because their collection of primary resources is incredible. And I would recommend anybody who cares to listen to definitely check out their stuff. Um, I, I, I certainly have found a lot of benefit from studying the primary sources and like looking at the overall perspective of the people over on Mormoner. Your memes are also excellent. And so I will fully plug that in as well. Uh, anyway, though, polygamy, when we're talking about sexuality, again, Bill claims that Joseph Marion has sexual relationships with women as young as 14 years old. This is, of course, an allusion to Helen Mark Kimball, who was about 14 when she was sealed to the Prophet Joseph Smith. Um, unfortunately, though, what Bill doesn't seem to mention is that while there is some evidence for sexuality among some of Joseph Smith's plural wives, the vast, vast majority, we, we just don't have any evidence for. So the fact of the matter is, is that Bill is making a claim here where Joseph, where Joseph Smith is sleeping with, with girls who are 14 years old, and there's just no evidence to prove that. He tries to make that claim and he doesn't substantiate it in any way. And that was just, that was disappointing for me. Um, Joseph Smith was sealed to women who were already married, presumably having sexual relationships with them as well. Uh, again, though, from this list, this, this list here, by the way, comes from Don Bradley and uh, Brian Hale's website, Joseph Smith Polygamy. They have made the polygamy documents, I believe it's Mormon Polygamy Documents, that's their website. Yeah. Also, Joseph Smith Polygamy. Um, they've made this accessible to just about everybody. So this is, if you, if you don't believe me, you're more than welcome to go and take a look at those primary sources yourself. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of the stuff that Bill says here is wrong. So the youngest relationships I was able to find where there's any kind of evidence for sexuality is, um, 17 or 18. I believe it might be 17, but... It certainly it is not 14 as Bill claims. So when Bill says this, he is absolutely stretching it. Um, but even then, he's kind of, he's he's making this claim and he doesn't expound about how some of the nuances about it. So for example, uh, Lucy Walker happened to be 17 when she was sealed to the prophet Joseph Smith. And uh, she cites a very, very spiritual experience wherein she she was approached about it and she was... Um, she was she was really torn up about it. Uh, she talks about how she lost sleep over it, um, but then she had this really powerful spiritual experience, and she had basically testified to her that she and that polygamy was in fact something that Joseph Smith was commanded to practice, and she then very soon thereafter was sealed to Joseph, and. So, for for instance, when he cites complaints like this, he doesn't explain the nuances of those kinds of experiences. I think Bill does try to do it in other places, but, I mean, I, I feel like that's an important caveat to talk about if we're really trying to be, uh, to foster critical thinking, as as Bill claims these, these sources are trying to do. Uh, it would be useful to go back to the original primary sources and talk about how each individual person felt about what they were practicing because most of these women who practice polygamy they defended it for the vast vast majority of their lives helen mark kimball the 14 year old referenced was probably one of the most adamant and the most prolific defenders of polygamy and um her stuff can be found her, her stuff can be found like i said by a bunch of different primary sources but i, I feel like that stuff warrants mention if you're really going to talk about this idea that joseph smith is practicing polygamy like specifically how the woman felt um, regarding being a seal to multiple women who were already married in spite of what DNC 132 says, uh, a closer reading of DNC 132 indicates something differently. So I, um, I would advise readers to go back and read that a little bit more carefully. I, I go into a little bit of that in my longer response to this. Hopefully I'll get that published here soon. But, um, 
actually with with in terms of evidence of sexuality none of the women on this list here are actually concurrently married except for maybe mary heron where the evidence is weak anyway um there's evidence to where she she might have been concurrently married but there's also some people who said that she was separated from her husband at the time and so it it, it just um with, with kind of divorce being a tricky subject back in like the 1800s backwoods areas anyway it's it, it becomes a lot more difficult to really kind of establish that joseph smith was just trying to get with other people's wives and so i i i have a hard time with bill's complaint there because i don't think it's accounting for all of the historical record but we'll just keep going um joseph smith was sealed to himself uh, sealed himself to other women before emma uh this is kind of a tricky one I my heart goes out to Emma because this is this is accurate when we have Joseph Smith at least well actually there, there's a bit of a problem with that though because I can't really say that we don't know how much Emma knew about polygamy throughout the different parts so for example we have certain sources talking about how Joseph Smith at least knew about Fanny Alger uh but those are kind of late sources and so we're not quite sure exactly how to how to deal with those and the truth is that we don't know how much emma knew um to assume that she did or didn't know is to go beyond the historical data i i don't think that's unfair to say uh one thing i did find that was kind of interesting though is that emma actually participates in a couple of the plural marriages herself wherein she talks to, where she selects a couple of different women for joseph to to be sealed to and this includes uh, Sarah Maria Lawrence. This includes, um, try, uh, trying to remember who else. Sorry, my, I'm having a hard time seeing that. It's uh, and it's Eliza and Emily Partridge. So um, we don't know the exact date. Uh, and there's some question and there's, there's, there's a reason to assume that some of them might have been already sealed to joseph primarily to that but what i found to be really interesting about the story is that emma participates in this before she herself is sealed to joseph which is something i didn't really pick up on before she she actually wants other women to be sealed to joseph before she herself enters into that covenant and i thought that was kind of interesting like the question at that one becomes is is how much of this is emma feeling conflicted about polygamy and how much of this is her just feeling or her just not knowing about it. And so again, once again, to assume that Emma just doesn't know and that Joseph is just purposefully, fully, maliciously trying to hide this from Emma, I think goes beyond the historical data. And Bill is making, again, assumptions about that based on incomplete information. Uh, yes. So he then continues by saying Joseph Smith would bully or pressure a woman into marrying him. This is just, um, I, I, I don't find these claims to be very convincing because we have records of several different women from that time being approached about polygamy and the woman declining and then having no retaliation whatsoever. So I have a, uh, a book referenced up here, A Houseful of Females by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. I've got it right here. It's a great book. It's an excellent treatment on polygamy. I would go so far as to say that it is the rough stone rolling equivalent what rough stone rolling is to joseph smith uh houseful of females is to polygamy i found that to be a really good treatment it tries to be fair uh i believe that the author is lds but i don't think he would ever be able to pick up on that just by reading it and so i i do think it tries to be fair um one of the stories that's talked about in this is about a gal named lydia moon so we have just we have william clayton here pictured above joseph smith um, both of them approach Lydia about entering into plural marriage, but, uh, one of the things that Lydia actually ends up turning both of them down and we have no record whatsoever of there being any kind of negative consequences. Like I said before, for, you know, any kind of retribution or vengeance from Joseph's part acting against the moon family. And again, I, I just, I don't know why he says that, especially when we consider other testimonies like that of Cordelia C. Morley, 
In the spring of 44, Plural Marriage was introduced to me by my parents from Joseph Smith, asking their consent and request to me to be his wife. Imagine, if you can, my feelings to be a plural wife, something I never thought I could ever could. I knew nothing of such religion and could not accept it, neither did I. And once again, there is no record of retaliation by Joseph Smith against Cordelia Morley. Um, this is Lucy Walker saying something very much the same. Uh, a woman would have her choice. This was a privilege that could not be denied her. And again, speaking of plural marriage, wherein uh, Joseph Smith would not force anybody to enter into plural marriage, which is funny because this is coming from Lucy, where I know some critics of the church tried to point to her story as an example of Joseph Smith allegedly being manipulative. Um, but again, this is clearly how Lucy felt about the matter. And so I'm I'm inclined to take her at her word for it. Hashtag so, the people win. <laughs> I uh something like that. I I just think it's really fascinating because one of the things I did not expect to find as I researched more about polygamy, first off, is just how much the women were actually writing about it. I, I didn't expect that. Um a, a lot of people, I I just know that record keeping back then can just be a little bit tricky. Yeah, but and like so, Helen Mary Kimball wrote like an entire treatise in like 1882 defending Joseph Smith's polygamy and stuff like that. So it was pretty common, surprisingly. Yeah. And I, I that was really interesting for me. And clearly these women felt strongly about the fact that it came from God. And I their their faith is inspirational to me. Um well, I'll get to that more here in a second, because I have a couple of parting shots before we, we wrap up with this. Um Bill claims that polygamy was promised never to be taken off the earth. He is, of course, citing a revelation given to John Taylor in 1886, which allegedly states this. Um, this really just isn't, I, I don't find this to be fully, I, I don't find this to be compelling. Um, this is this is usually just coming from a conflation of the terms new and everlasting covenant versus new and everlasting covenant of marriage. Uh, in the Doctrine and Covenants, for example, the New and Everlasting Covenant is referred to as the Gospel, I believe in DNC 66. I am um, something to the tune of that. Uh, I, I go again, I go more deeply into this in other places, but this is this is of course confirmed by other historians such as D. Michael Quinn, which I wasn't expecting. Uh, D. Michael Quinn states that as a historian, I find there is abundant evidence to demonstrate that the 1886 revelation occurred. However, in my view, it really added nothing to any of the revelations that had been given on plural marriage. And so I, I think that that's, that that's something worth mentioning. D. Michael Quinn was eventually excommunicated, but I don't think he ever changed his opinion on this. I'm open to other information on this topic, but I am... Um, when we have multiple different sources kind of talking about how this really... This, this idea that polygamy is promised to never be taken off the earth... When we have multiple sources confirming that that's not really what happened and that's not what this revelation is saying, I think it's something definitely worth to take into account. And it certainly isn't something that um, members have to believe. Because, again, one of the things Bill claims is that members must believe these things. So we certainly don't have to believe that polygamy was promised to never be taken off of the earth, as is demonstrated. Yeah, I don't remember the last time I was asked that by my bishop when I was renewing my uh, temple recommend, but you know, right. Well, yeah. And so, I, I, my biggest problem here with, and this is something that I think goes along with a lot of this sort of thing, uh, a lot of the historical aspects about LDS theology, and of course, its history is, I, I find them to be interesting, but a lot of them really do kind of boil down to be almost kind of like trivia, like historical. Oh, did you know that? There was the great moon hoax in eighteen in the eighteen hundreds, and people the church believed that people lived on the moon. And I just think to myself, oh, okay, cool. I, I don't see how that relates to me trying to build a relationship with God, but I, I mean that is that is there. And I'm not trying to downplay the how historical issues might impact people's faith. I mean, our history helps build the provides the building blocks that leads up to today. I I just um. A lot of this stuff, I, I maybe it's the fact that I'm just, you know, been surrounding myself with this so much that maybe it just, maybe it just doesn't bother me anymore. I mean, now that's not the case for everything. Like, for for instance, in terms of polygamy, I I don't want to practice polygamy. I don't. I I know Robert, you've got that great shirt where it's uh, I heart polygamy, 
And I think it's funny and I laugh just about every time I see you wearing it. But I, me personally, I don't think I, I don't like the prospect of practicing polygamy. I think it would be really hard. I think it would be difficult for the saint, uh, for the saints today to live it. And it was difficult for them to live it. But I do think that there are a couple of things that can be said about polygamy. So one, um, as I've written out here, it's I don't believe Joseph Smith's pra um, practice of polygamy was selfishly motivated. As, as you study how the woman portrayed Joseph Smith's interactions with them, and also kind of the the, the sources that we have that are the most reliable, I think that it's safe to say that Joseph Smith, if nothing else, Joseph Smith believed that he was doing something that God told him to do. Um, two, I believe that that plays into two is I believe that those who practice polygamy believe that it was commanded by God. It wasn't them just trying to sleep around the, the woman writing about it state that if Joseph was really just trying to, um, sleep around that there were a lot of other easier ways to do it, but instead Joseph Smith is practicing polygamy and this is, this has very deep spiritual undertones, um, complemented by spiritual experiences um, and then also number three, I, I will, ha I do have to concede that even if I don't like polygamy, that there were certain benefits that came to the saints because they practiced polygamy. In the Utah Territory, it's my understanding that the women at that time were some among the first women to be able to vote. They were running businesses. They were able to do things that the women in the rest of the United States were unable to do. But by our modern standards, we're like, oh, hey, good for them. That's, that, that's good that they were, they were rather progressive in that time, in that sense. So those are kind of my thoughts about polygamy. And while I certainly by no means want to trivialize the effects that polygamy may have, I mean, it's in our scripture, DNC 132, and it's referenced in other places as well. But I, I don't think polygamy in of itself has to be something that challenges faith, because the more that we, the more I've studied their thoughts about the, the way that the early saints felt about polygamy, the more I begin to realize that this is them trying their best to live with integrity and live with faith. So that, that that's are my thoughts. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Robert. Um, there's a part of me that just wants to share that image of me with the ad shirt, but I don't think that would be ap appropriate uh, in this presentation. But no, I think that's a very good overview of like, uh, some of the, because just based on this presentation, it doesn't seem like he actually has added anything new to the discussion. Um, you know, in terms of say the objections and so forth, I could be mistaken. Maybe he had like some kind of a um, more nuanced take, but yeah, that's good. And like definitely, everyone should check out the primary sources. So like say um, MormonPolygamyDocuments.org on the BH Roberts website, MormonOr.org, you can find like a bunch of um, primary source research uh, sources as well. Um, and also like um, you know the work of Brian Hill, Stellan Bradley, and with some caveats, Todd Compton um, and S. Carmen Hardy would be like. Um, as well yeah, as the I, Ulrich book. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I've I've read bits and pieces of Todd Compton's work. Some of it's all right. I do think some of it's a little bit dated. Yeah. Uh, so for for instance, his take on Lucy Walker, I don't think fully comprehends how Lucy how Lucy actually felt about polygamy, and I think that there are a couple of things that um, I would have analyzed differently. I would have taken more into the. I, I would have taken other sources into account. I would have gone more deeply into Lucy's words on her experiences because it's yeah. my understanding, for example, like Compton, he believes that Lucy was basically coerced into doing a threat with damnation. And I, I don't think the historical record supports that. I don't think that's how Lucy felt about it. Yeah, I agree. That's why I would say like with some nuance, like if you, you can sift through his book and it's very difficult in terms of the, the resources to like make sense of the footnotes at times, like there's like some good historical information. Sometimes he's correct. Just like you have to be very careful because um, as I said, like yeah, it, it's pretty dated. Like he did have like a knob. I've actually talked to him in person. He's a very nice guy, he even served in Ireland in the 60s. But um uh yeah it he did clearly have a bias um you know but we all do you know every all interpretations theory laden but yeah yeah but definitely like uh the works of brian hills and also Ulrich and a few others as well would be like um the must reads in terms of secondary literature yeah i'll also plug an interpreter article that i found to be useful when talking about this it's um it's a response to grant palmer it was written by gregory l smith and brian hales um i'll see if i can pull that up later just so that people can kind of take a look at it i found it was useful um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share in the, um, chat channel while he, uh,
That'd be great. Because I, I know you've read them because I, I sincerely doubt that there's a text in the English language you have not read. Um, that, 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 that's just my take on it, but I, I think we'll move on. Uh, this next one, I believe is another kind of a touchy subject. It's talking about race and interracial marriage as regarded through the history of LDS theology and kind of the statements that were given in the 1800s regarding race and interracial marriage. Um, some, some of these are I, I will before I launch into this, I, I understand that it's a touch ironic having two white guys talk about race and interracial marriage. I one of the things I will first do is I will refer people to um your interview with Tarek Lacour on on your channel because I know you've talked to him about this and he has some really good insights about this this specific. Uh Paul Reeve also has some good material on this, and I think it's important. Um I want to say Spencer W. Kimball's son did a history on uh, President Kimball's kind of exploration with this topic, and I think it's rather it's it's rather intriguing. I I remember being I remember finding that on my mission, or it might have been just after. But um, there are lots of really great resources that people can find that are given by by people who are incredibly informed about this subject, but. I, Russell, um, yeah, Russell Stevenson uh, would be another good person as well, and Jeffrey Bradshaw. They've done a lot of work uh, on these issues as well. Thank you for that. Yes. And, and I will also note, like, if you ever watch the movie The Commitments, uh, the Irish are the blacks of Europe, so I kind of get a pass <laughs> here. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have that pass, but um, w there are a couple of things that he lists. Uh, people of African descent could not hold the priesthood until 1978. Uh, church leaders believe that the curse of Cain continued through Ham and explains the origins of African peoples. Uh, Book of Mormon Lamanites were cursed with dark skin. He cites 2 Nephi 5.21 as evidence of this, and it's reversed when you accept the gospel. People with black skin were less valiant in the pre-existence, and leaders have condemned interracial marriages in the past. So, a couple of different things. A lot of these are orbiting around this same specific topic, wherein we have a leader of the church taking a specific text and um, kind of providing their own 18th century Protestant baggage-laden interpretation of scriptures onto it. And so, for example, the, the people of African descent, this was, this was a belief that was tied to the curse of Cain um, that, that people believed in back in the 1800s. And the unfortunate reality is that I don't, it, it was, they were applying a reading that as further research has been done into it, uh, those previous leaders, they had no way of knowing, but it was, it was an interpretation that didn't coincide with what the texts actually said. So if you study more about the curse of Cain, it wasn't necessarily a curse as much as it was a protection of Cain, is my understanding. Uh, careful reading of Genesis, I believe, will lead someone to that conclusion, but um I guess there's a there's a part of me that wonders if Bill how how deeply Bill is looking into this when he's talking about these complaints, because all three of these things aren't necessarily the fact that members of the church must deal with these themselves. I think you and I can both agree that it is a fact that people of African descent could not hold the priesthood until 1978, with a couple of very notable exceptions. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily the thing that we have a problem with. What what people what members of the church typically have a problem with when we're talking about this is okay. So this happened. Does this mean that we can't trust prophets anymore? And I find the answer to that to be no. Th but the reality of the situation is that prophets and leaders, just like all of us do, they have biases. They are subject to their own learning and. While they are certainly inspired and they certainly have authority to lead the church, it does not mean that whenever they read a scripture, they automatically know absolutely everything about said scripture. And this is something that I, I think can be affirmed by leaders of our church all throughout our history. So this is Stephen L. Richards. This is arguably one of my favorite quotes from a general conference talk probably ever when talking about prophets, because I think it, it helps kind of divide what they what they do and don't know. I think Elder Richards does a good job. Um, it says, in matters of church government and discipline and judgment of presiding officers is mandatory and controlling. Uh, in matters of individual guidance to members, their counsel is directory and persuasive only. 
in interpretation of scripture and doctrine, they are dependent upon their knowledge and experience and inspiration. So again, kind of talking about this idea that while leaders certainly may have um, additional information and may have authoritative speaking when talking about policies and how the church is supposed to be run, it does not necessarily entail that they know absolutely everything about a specific set of scriptures. And I, I, I don't, so to claim that the, the church is just kind of running away from this idea that prophets um, kind of know everything. Uh, this is something that's been, this is something that's been debunked rather thoroughly in our theology for pretty much its entire existence. Um, John Witso says something similar. Uh, when inspired writers deal with historical incidents, they relate that which they have seen or that which they may have been told, unless indeed the past is open to them by revelation. Again, once again, uh, implying the idea that when it comes to scriptural interpretation, they are certainly, they, they are dependent at least to some extent on their previous study and information that's available to them on the time. I like President Nelson's thoughts on revelation wherein he talks about uh, good revelation or good inspiration comes from good information. I think there's something to be said there about how prophets interact with people. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Brigham Young is uh, this one, which actually often gets cited by critics of the church, usually out of context, wherein they cite this first sentence, that, which says, I have never yet preached a sermon and sent it out to the children of men that they may not call scripture, and then they just stop citing it. But Brigham goes on to say, let me have the privilege of correcting a sermon, and it is as good as scripture as they deserve. This, I think, is, is telling both of kind of who Brigham is. Granted, another discussion could be had about how much Brigham feels like he needed to be corrected about a couple of different topics. But at least in a theoretical sense, Brigham was open to the idea that things that he said might need to be corrected later, either by him or by others, I would say. And in our theology, we are absolutely open to the idea of continuing our relation. We kind of have to be. I mean, by by necessity, the fact that Joseph Smith claimed to be able to add to the canon uh, of scripture besides the Bible was, it, it kind of goes to show that things need to be added upon and that we are constantly learning, we are constantly improving. Um, I believe you were the first person to point out to me that uh, in DNC 128, there's this idea of continuing revelation where there's more and more information, stuff that we don't know, stuff that we've never learned. And we're going to continue learning about that today. Yeah, that, that's verse 18 in reference to the um, this dispensation. Yeah. Right. And so as we go back and we study the historical sources, I first, I think a couple of things can be demonstrated. First, I think that any idea that prophets are perfect uh, is immediately shot down when you listen to the actual prophets talking about the subject. They're like, absolutely not. We are not perfect. We don't know everything. We do the best with the best information that we have. And I, I, it's unfortunate when, when stuff like this does happen, because it did persist for a good long while. I want to say it was like a full century, right? And granted, a lot of people didn't know about it. I think that was that was one thing I learned from your interview with uh, Tarek that I think was rather insightful. I didn't know that, like a, a apostle, then apostle David O. McKay, when he was recently called to be an apostle, he heard about it, and he didn't know about it. And so, as one thing that I will absolutely. Uh, before we get to that, one thing that I will absolutely state with, with certainty is, while I certainly believe prophets are authoritative, and I certainly believe that they are reliable in what they talk about, I I don't think there's any reason from our theology to assume that they are basically controlled by, by godlike sock puppets. I refer to this term as sock puppet prophets, where when some a lot of a lot of people specifically, I found a lot of um general Christians, Protestants, that sort of thing, they believe that when when a prophet says, thus saith the Lord, it is literally word for word the prophet stuff. So it is, for all intents and purposes, you have God in there, it's just like, thus saith the Lord, that sort of thing. I, I don't think that that idea is supported very well by our theology, and I think if you read 
comments from Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and our leaders throughout our history carefully, you will find that the vast majority of them say, no, it's, it's this, there's always a bit of a, the human element in scripture. Uh, if you want to read more about that, I will certainly plug uh, Michael Ash's book, Rethinking Revelation. I, I recently finished that. It is an excellent, excellent treatment on this oh, subject. I, um, I, 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 I would dare say that it is almost a must read for people trying to talk about prophets. Yep. And just just so I will, uh, in case I forget, uh, at the B.H. Roberts Foundation, we are currently working on like a massive uh, project on prophetic fallibility and mapping what prophets have said about themselves and the nature of prophets and apostles from like Joseph Smith's time to the present. So uh, at the moment, there's about 360 plus sources at the moment. So like once that's done, uh, that'll be like a um, must, uh, must have source as well. I would be, I would love to be able to look over that because that's, that's something that I think would be really, really useful. Um, there's a common saying, or at least I've heard it often where, uh, Catholics believe the Pope is perfect, but, um, no one really believes it. Prophets say that they are imperfect and the members of the church don't believe it. Some to the tune of that. Sometimes I think we as members of the church can kind of put le our leaders on a pedestal. I'm like, that's good. We should have respect and admiration for people who have tried their best to make a good connection with God and try to lead members of the church. But I, I don't think there's any reason to assume that they're perfect or the idea that um, just because something has been said from the pulpit or something has existed in the church that it was necessarily God's will that it happened. But that's just kind of my take on it. Um, kind of moving on from there. Uh, valiance in terms of the pre-existence. Bill claims that leaders taught that people with black skin were less valiant in the pre-existence. Joseph Fielding Smith outright least denied the idea that anyone is forced to believe this idea. This is this is, this is um. I believe the original of this is this is a secondhand source that comes from. I'm trying to remember the exact place, but I believe it was from some interview. It was published in Dialogue, I think. At least a couple of times. But basically, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, when talking about this, he says, you do not have to believe that Negroes are denied the priesthood because of the preexistence. I have always assumed that because it was what I was taught and it made sense. But you don't have to believe it to be in good standing because it is not definitely stated in the scriptures. And I've received no revelation on the matter. Yeah, that was to Eugene England. who had like a um, Eugene England, about yes. It. Yeah. yeah. I am... Um, I have these linked throughout my my response here, but I just can't like I can't give good links and powerpoints that they don't they don't usually work out super well. But um, one of the things that I, I think that's rather useful because Bill going back to Bill's claim, these are all things that members of the church must believe, and yet we have a leader of the church stating the exact opposite. And so I I, I think that I think that's something worth mentioning. Um, in terms of the the curse in the Book of Mormon, I don't. I, I'm not going to take the time to read these verses. Most of the people reading this do, but basically, if you skim over uh, verse 21, it talks about this idea that there was a cursing that came upon them. Uh, that is the Lamanites, and it also discusses that their skins became. A, there was a skin of blackness that came upon them. Historically, members of the church and leaders of the church have sometimes attributed this to being the. Um, that the skin of blackness was viewed to be a curse. But if we're looking at the, the context of the Book of Mormon, I don't think that that's supported by the text. For example, if you read verse 20, it talks about how the curse is them being cut off from the presence of the Lord. And when verse 21 is talking about the cursing in that first sentence, it is referring to the cursing previously mentioned. At least that's my view. And I, I the... Uh, I find that this, this little quip here from Bill is funny. He says that the Book of Mormon teaches it regardless of what apologists say. I I, I do think that's a little tongue-in-cheek, but this isn't necessarily just us saying that. I, um, I do think it can be supported by other ancient texts, including the Bible itself. Um, we do have a couple of texts here. From Just before Joe, you continue, I, I do kind of find it ironic that like he's a fan of Dan McClellan, but it seems like Bill believes that texts have inherent intentional meaning but that's that's just me i 
that's something I've thought about too. If we're really going to take it at face value, or if we're really willing to accept the idea, uh, based off of reason and you know revelation, I would argue that the Book of Mormon is in fact an ancient document that's translated. Then trying to read nineteenth century implications into the text all the time doesn't seem to be the best way to go about interpreting the Book of Mormon. Now, granted. The Book of Mormon, I think you and I would both agree, is a 19th century translation. It certainly has phrases and words in there, and to an extent, some some ideas that might be traced back to the 19th century. But trying to only read it as a 19th century fabricated text, or inspired fiction, as some might try to put it, I don't think it counts for all of the data. So, for example, um, we, we talked about in a previous podcast when I was chatting with you, just about different Hebraisms. Uh, Brent Gardner has done a lot of good work on the Book of Mormon as a historical document about different things, how it lines up rather well. Book of Mormon events line up rather well with contemporary Miss American events. Um, so I, I don't think that uh, trying to view it at the Book of Mormon as being expressly 19th century in origin, I think, I, I don't think it I don't think that's accounting for all of the stuff that we find and all the like the like the really deep meaning found within it, but also kind of like the text itself. Like the, the Book of Mormon is a very complex document that makes a lot of very it, it makes a lot of specific claims. It also has a lot of different Hebraisms that I think are rather insight. Uh, uh, they're interesting to study and they I also think they add credit to the claim that it is an authentic ancient record. But, yeah, shout out to Matthew Bowen's work on uh, wor words and names in the Book of Mormon and various um, puns in the text as well, but yeah. Yep, yeah, or even just uh, John Welch and Chiasmus, Neil Rapley and Nahum. There, I could, uh, examples can be multiplied, but the uh, we're, we are getting a little off topic here. When talking about the skin of blackness, there are a couple of instances in the biblical text that talk about um, the skin of blackness being... Not 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 necessarily being a curse, but also having a lot to do with basically countenance. So when they talk about the skin of blackness being put upon them, it has to do with uh, not necessarily their skin changing color, but kind of a um, kind of having to do with how much they they ascribe the spirit to be with them, if that makes sense. So when we look at lamentations, for instance. Uh, we have their visage is blacker than a coal, and they are not known in the streets. Their skin cleave it to their bones, and it is withered and become like a stick. So when it talks about their visage is blacker than a coal, it's not necessarily, I, I don't think the text itself is saying their skin is changing color. I think that it's referring to this idea that, um, it, it, like I said before, it has to do with their countenance, how it appears to be fallen. I might have to flush this idea out a little bit more in other places. But I think that by comparing these specific passages found within the KJV and comparing it with the Book of Mormon text, I think is useful in that regard. And I think it helps harmonize a couple of different ideas because uh, in 2 Nephi 5, we have this idea of a skin of blackness coming upon them. But And then just maybe a, couple, a few short chapters later, we have 2 Nephi 26, which talks about everyone is welcome to come unto me black and white, bond and free, that sort of thing. And so when I think we we try to understand the historical context of the phrase skin of blackness by comparing it with biblical texts, I think there is something to be said about how that can be useful. Um, Like yeah, I said... Uh, I'm not sure yeah. if you deal with this here, but like um, one text I always go to is like Alma 55, where like um, Nephites are confused with being Lamanites by the Lamanites. And it's simply like say Lamanites are black, literally, and Nephites are white, literally. And how could they confuse one with the other? Um, you know, that narrative. I do cite I do cite that there. I believe it's I, I cite the story where um was it Captain Moroni? He's like trying to find people to invade this town and he needs a Lamanite. And he, he there's there's a phrase in there that I think is kind of interesting. It talks about there's a search to be made. And to which I respond, okay, so if there's a search to be made, that search, if we're, if we're talking about the super, super literally, that search doesn't need to last very long. Because if we're talking literally about skin color, then that's not going to take very long. But as we study the Book of Mormon text more closely, we um, 
we find that there's a, there's a really interesting case to be made about a skin of blackness not being literal. I know Book of Mormon Central came out with a video about that rather recently. Um, I, I definitely refer people to that as well, but I think we've we've um we're beating a dead horse at this point, so we'll we'll continue. Again, I want to reinstate this idea that revelation is received by our leaders in a similar way that we receive revelation, and that comes through, of course, our intuition reason uh to an extent the behavior of others helps prompt revelation time experience all of these things play in a complicated mishmash of they were they work together in a way that that leads us to specific conclusions and i would argue that the spirit works through each of those mediums to help lead people closer to god and I think when we look at Revelation being kind of structured in that way, it becomes easier to kind of reconcile these ideas where if we run into a historical quote that maybe makes us wonder, okay, what's going on here? I think understanding that prophets receive Revelation um, in a similar way that we do through the still small voice of the Spirit, as the scriptures say, I think it becomes a lot easier to understand that they're not doing anything to try and lead us away from God. And while they are certainly not perfect, they are absolutely able to accomplish their goal of bringing us closer to God. Um, to assume otherwise, I think I, Bill Bill might push back against. If I want, if I was to put myself in Bill's shoes, he might say, "Well, then why? How can we trust prophets if they're imperfect?" I would immediately think to myself, "Well, that that almost seems logically fallacious in nature." I, I'm familiar with the uh, the Nirvana fallacy or the perfectionist fallacy, wherein um, just because something doesn't do something perfectly doesn't mean that it is inherently worthless or does something or is doing something wrong. So, for example, just because prophets are imperfect, it does not necessitate that they are not inspired. And so, I I, I would push back against that that way, but we'll just we'll just keep going because I think we are on Book of Mormon anachronisms now. Uh, this this next section should be a lot easier. Uh, basically, Bill outlines a couple different things. These are six of them. Uh, horses, chickens, pigs, cows, silk, and barley, wherein he claims that these are animals that did not exist in the Book of Mormon times, and they are consequently anachronistic, thus adding to the evidence, so to speak, that the Book of Mormon is not true. But what he does not necessarily know, or does not cite, is that there are several articles now that are done by non-LDS sources talking about how these were actually in the New World, albeit in lo different locations. So for instance, uh, the one on the left, we have post-Pleistocene horses from Mexico, wherein we have horses on um, horse bones being identified as being in Mesoamerica, in Mexico, at around the time that the Book of Mormon is found, both in Jaredite times and also in like the, the Nephite times. If memory serves, I that's definitely something I'd recommend your viewers to go check out. Uh, we also have this one on the right talking about uh, pre-Columbians having access to chickens, where they were brought over from Polynesia. Although that those that's um, those bones are specifically found in Chile, but I think it goes to show that there's a lot more complexity to this ar whole archaeological record thing than Bill is letting on. Yeah, and also and, just on chickens, uh, there was an article by Carl L. Johansson, uh, Melanotic Chicken Use in Chinese Traits in Guatemala, uh, in the journal Revisita de Historia de America 93, where he discusses um, remains of black bone chickens in Alta Verapaz, Guatemala. So that's closer to like a uh, like Mormon lands as well. That That's that's true. I would actually like you to send that to me if you would. I, I would appreciate that. Because um, I was looking over that and I'm granted while my BYU student membership would allow me to access a lot of different material i i certainly will take a lot more and i it's certainly not comprehensive and i appreciate all the help i can get um but we also have an interesting discussion to be made about loan shifting um as stephen smoot made a good joke about this i appreciated it was um uh as they they kind of joke shift happens uh, I believe he said that in a discussion with uh, uh, Stephen Murphy on when they were doing an interview. 
Uh, but basically, this concept of loan shifting, wherein you have people who put names on new animals or new things that correspond to things that they already know. So, for example, the the most common example I know of is the word hippopotamus. It, I believe the derivative of that word really translates back to water horse. Despite the fact we would look at that and say, well, a hippo doesn't look like a horse all that much at all. What ancient people did is they took words that they already knew and prescribed them on the new things that they found. So, for example, uh, I picked these two pictures up from a BYU article talking about things that uh, animals that existed in Mesoamerica right around the time the Nephites allegedly would have been there. Um, you can kind of take a look at that there. But on the left, we have something that looks very much like a cow. And we have on something on the right that looks very much like a pig. Uh, despite the fact that they, um, the animal on the left is not a true bowing and the animal on the right is a peccary. But absolutely, I can take a look at that and say I can see exactly why ancient people would have prescribed uh, cow or pig as a title on this. And I actually did this. I, I did this for fun. So I actually showed these pictures to my friends. And I was like, hey, what animal is this? And I'm like, is that a pig? I was like, well, that certainly would be something that the Nephites thought or might have thought. And so I um, I think it's interesting to talk about loan shifting. A similar explanations can be found about things like barley, silk, and a number of other anachronisms. Uh, really interesting work has been done by some researchers about how when the Spanish came over, they looked at some of these animals and they gave them those similar kinds of names where they looked at, uh, I, I believe the example they gave, uh, Dan Peterson cited was tapirs where the Spanish called them horses. And I, I believe that, uh, I, I believe there's some interesting stuff to be said there. But again, this goes back to show that a lot of this stuff isn't really addressed in Bill's discussion. There's a lot of incomplete information and an assumption about what must have been the case for the Book of Mormon times. And the, the assumptions that Bill brings to the table I don't think are justified because um, putting aside the fact that we do have evidence for horses in Mesoamerica, we could be completely wrong and they might be bringing in different animals. I mean, that they might have referred to those as horses. I, like I said, load shifting has been discussed about tapirs and horses. And so I I don't think it's I don't think it's wise to bring assumptions to the text as bill does because you're often you you might be missing something and you might so you certainly might not be justified in said assumptions but uh the the facts might say something completely different and so i i i think that um i think that bill would be it would be helpful for bill to kind of address these arguments as well in in there because i don't think he does just, just because like those of ex Mormons and antis like make fun of the whole horses here to peers. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, um, I'm quick quiz for you. Uh, the following comes from like a source. If I see three horses in a pasture, I would count them as ox, tool, tizamine. Ox, tree, tool, classifier for animate teens, tizamine, horse or tapir. Uh, guess who wrote that? Who who wrote that? Michael Coe. Is that right? Yeah, that's breaking the Maya Code, third edition, pages 52 to 53, where he treats and translates the term tizamine as either horse or tapir. That's interesting to note. And for, for, for your viewers who don't necessarily know why that's significant, Michael Coe has gone on very, has been, has tried to be very vocal. I think he's recently passed away, but he went on different podcasts such as Mormon Stories. I know he had an, a couple of interviews with John DeLynn talking about how the Book of Mormon is not historical and that these kinds of explanations don't really cut it for him. But I think it's interesting how Michael Coe and other portions of publications seems to indicate something different. So that that's that's interesting to note. <laughs> um, By the way, but, I should mention that the B.H. Roberts Foundation will be releasing um, a huge project on Book of Mormon anachronisms either this month or April. So be on the outlook for that. I certainly will do that. And like I said, I, I will absolutely plug the B.H. Roberts Foundation and Mormoner for, for a lot of their research. They are they are spectacular. Um, 
Let's see. There we are. So this is this is the part where it's going to be a little bit more interactive, Bill, um, Robert, because we're gonna we're gonna talk we're gonna go through some of these complaints, and we're both gonna kind of take a look at this. So complaint number fourteen: Lehi's family is strangely referring to themselves as Christians before such a term or belief ever exists, and yet don't ever mention any of the Jewish laws, customs, feasts, etc. So I, there are two parts to this. And what, the one is kind of veiled underneath the other, but the, the chief complaint here is that Lehi is referring to themselves as Christians. I, I think you and I both know the answer to this. My take on it is um, Joseph Smith, this is a 19th century translation, and Christ is a Greek term. It means the anointed one is my understanding. And so there's no reason to assume that when Nephi is writing this, he is using Greek terms. Now, one might complain that that's anachronistic, but um, terms like Messiah are not. And no, Messiah appears all throughout the Hebrew Bible. Yes. And, and the Septuagint translates it as Christos, and the verb um, Meshach as Creo, where we get Christos as well. well. Exactly. And so to assume that just because we have a, a more modern translation use the term Christ and like Greek terms and prescribe them into allegedly more Hebrew texts. I don't think that's super far off because it does seem that I, I, either I, I mean maybe it's possible. Maybe maybe Nephi in his vision picked up on the idea that he you know the Greek term for the Messiah would be Christ. I don't know. I, I doubt that, but I um just because we find the term Christ in the Book of Mormon does not prove that, A, it's anachronistic, or B, that Joseph Smith is just making this up or making a mistake. Yeah, because like uh, many of the personal names in, say, the King James and even modern translations of the Bible, they're not actually reflective of the transliteration, like, say, the Hebrew. It's actually like either a Gre Grecized version or an Anglicized version of the name. Like, it's not Aob or Chava, or it's actually Job and um, Eve and stuff like that. So, um uh, it's like tell me you're a monarch god without telling me you're a monarch god you know and i say this as somebody who speaks english as a second language i i i sometimes wonder what what bill was necessarily thinking um in regards to the whole jewish laws customs and these things the book of Mormon is not meant to be a comprehensive thing i mean this is moroni compiling a bunch of d different things with an attempt to point towards christ and he only references the law when he talks about it pointing towards Christ. Yeah. And so I, I don't understand why I would be surprised if we did see like deep dive comprehensive things in the Jewish laws, customs, feasts, etc. If we were really to believe the idea that plates were hard to engrave upon for them and the fact that Joseph Smith just, yeah, I, I, it, it just doesn't make sense. Well, may, maybe the, uh, steel man he's arguing okay, you know, yeah, he, he, he might, he might say, well, that's only about the abridgment Mormon at all made. Like, um, Nephi would have made it when the law of Moses was still um, in force, if you will. But like, if you look at, say, the historical books of the Old Testament, and that should be how you should compare the Book of Mormon, with the exception of the instances where the Passover is restored, like in Josiah's reform in 2 Kings 22 24, it's never really mentioned. You know, it's just taken as a given. And, you know, um, there's a difference between like high context texts and low context texts, you know, the difference between modern history, ancient writing, ancient historians just like tech teens as a given, you know, unlike us moderns where we have to footnote and reference and mention everything as well. So, and also there's been a lot of very good stuff on potential festivals underlining like say Lehi's Exodus. Uh, Don Bradley has a discussion in his last 116 pages book. When it comes to King Benjamin's speech, D Stephen D. Ricks has done a very good job on showing how it fits Asian coronation rites. The late John Tretness had an article in the 1990 Feshgrift in honor of Unibli, where he showed that there's a potential uh, Sukkot or Tabernacles background to the festival that's going on as well. So, yeah, um, it's... It, it's frankly, it's a piss poor argument, even if you want to steal man it, but yeah. I, like I said, I don't find this to be very convincing. I, um, I don't want to be mean, but I, I wish I say, I could say it gets better. I, we'll, we'll go over this here again. Um, so I'll, I'll read this out loud. Uh, it's, it is a, um, complaint number 45. It's that 
that God who created our world really had no idea about astronomy when comparing the kingdoms of glory to the sun, moon, and stars. The moon is just reflected light and has no illumination of its own, and the combined brightness of the stars would far exceed the brightness of a single sun in our solar system. In other words, God in this case, as with many others, seems to teach the current understanding of prophets with so with which so happens also to be false information, with little evidence that he teaches truth beyond what his prophets leader, leaders would already know from the present world. Yeah, we just talked about that. <laughs> um, also, like uh, the language of section 76 um, comes from like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you know, and again, it's from like the perspective of the author. He, it's not talking about a scientific triatus and cosmology. There's such thing as like phenomenological language or the language of appearances. And if you're looking outside, the sun seems brighter than, say, the distant stars, which seem brighter than the moon or what have you, you know. So it's not talking about, like, say, the origin of light in a cosmological physics sense. It's just like it's the language of fem phenomenology, it's language of appearances and using that, uh, which Paul is describing when it comes to, say, resurrected bodies and appropriating that and discussing it in the context of, say, the hereafter. Um, there, I mean, th this would fail like any exegesis 101 class. It's so juvenile. And even and, then, you don't have to be a believer in Joseph Smith's revelations to realize this is a really piss poor argument, you know? And uh, th that was my thought too, because I, I, I absolutely agree with you. This is Joseph Smith riffing off of what Paul's saying. When we're talking about Paul as an author, he absolutely would have no idea about. Um, I always get those two mixed up, like heliocentric, like the heliocentric model, where yeah, the yeah. idea we're orbiting around the sun. He wouldn't have any idea. He would, by necessity, need to be speaking symbolically. Yeah. More than like he would be in a geocentrist, would have like uh, the Old Testament altars as well. Right. But yeah. And so I, I, I looked at this and I just kept thinking to myself, like, why, why is this a problem? When we put ourselves in the shoes of the author, this doesn't have to be a problem. And again, what, what's a team, you know, of it? You know, what's a literary team? Even if you think it's like 19th century fiction and Joseph is trying to like, it's it's bunk. It's talking about the hereafter. And it, he's clearly borrowing from the language of First Corinthians with the addition of, of course, telestial. Um, right. But be that as made, like, it's not, talking, it's not saying like, well, you know, it's not talking about physics or cosmology, the source of the moon's light, or if it has its own light and so forth. No, it's like, it's language of appearances. And even if you as a modern were to look out, you know, into the sky, the sun would look brighter than, say, the most distant stars, even if you were to go up close to them. Like, of course, they would dwarf the sun or vice versa, and the moon as well. Again, it's, it's again, it's phenomenological language. It's a language of appearances. It's, I were to say, like, you know, the sun sets, you know, and the sun rises. That does not, per se, mean I'm a geocentrist. It's just, again, it's a language of appearances. Or, like, neither one of us believe, like, in soul sleep or soul death. But you could say, like, say your aunt who died, no, she's asleep because you're using, again, the language of appearances. And this is common throughout modern, uh, not just historical, but modern writings as well, you know, and so forth. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's baked with assumptions. Bill is yeah. bringing several assumptions to the table and he does not justify those assumptions. And, and those are absolutely facile. So let, let's keep going because it gets even oh, better. Geez. Um, scriptural prophets sometimes prophesy future events when they speak up oh, oh, pay, pay close attention to this I remember reading this and kind of laughing to myself because he actually doesn't he, he contradicts himself within this this complaint uh, scriptural prophets sometimes prophesy future events when they speak directly with God they tell the public that God spoke directly with them and that they are delivering God's message to them uh, modern prophets don't seem to ever prophesy future events as they seem to lack entirely the ability. They sometimes hint that they speak with God, but it is difficult to say for sure. Virtually any stories of them seeing God come from third-party accounts, one is never certain if the message they are delivering came from God or is their own opinion based on their reading of scripture. So, first things first, this, this complaint within itself con is contradictory. In one statement, Bill is saying that when God speaks directly, when prophets speak directly to God, they tell the public that God spoke directly to them and that they're delivering God's message. But then in the same breath, he is saying that prophets only sometimes hint that they speak with God, but it's difficult to say for sure. So I think that's a little bit confusing right off the bat. 
Um, additionally, he's making a couple of assumptions about what it means to prophesy. It is my understanding that if you go back to the original etymology of that word, it's not necessary, or the original definitions, I should say, sorry. It's not necessary. Um, prophesying does not necessarily mean to foretell something. It is to forth tell something. Yeah, the word it's just it's just like even in the most recent scholarly book on prophets by John um so Wal Walton, the guy who's done a lot of work on the cosmology of Genesis one, he basically says like one of the premises for like say Old Testament prophets is not they're predicting the future as often as we think they're to be. It, he's basically says something very Mormon, like they're basically foretellers, you know. Right. And this is this is of course confirmed by other um study Bibles. One of the ones I really like is the NRSV Cultural Background Study Bible. They have a whole section on this. I found that to be useful. Um, and so my my question to Bill is, why does why do we need to assume that prophets need to be foretelling things when, from the scriptural record, it's um, comparatively speaking, they never really do. And th there there are a couple. It is it is it is stated that. It is miraculous when they do, because most of the time they don't. And so I, I have no problem with the idea that, first off, we don't really need a lot of prophecies, because we're, hypothetically, we're in the last dispensation anyway. What else is there to predict? And so I, I, I mean, you can have, like, short-term prophecies. Um, I, I have a couple things to run by you in terms of prophecies here, because we're going to jump into open theism here in a second, because... Uh, I'd like to kind of pick your brain on that, but we'll we'll move on here so we can get there. Before we do, um, Robert, so uh, let me just read this real quick and I'll explain why I'm excited to talk with you about this. So, Complaint 73, Joseph Smith reported receiving priesthood keys from both Elias and Elijah. When in fact, scholars agree they are simply two different names for the same person. The naming convention here is differing in the New versus Old Testament. So he, of course, is saying this as to as a way to either poke fun at Joseph Smith or to say that Joseph Smith is just making this up and is really ignorant about the text. But in your books, you state something very, very different. Would you like to tell your viewers about it? Uh, yes, Joseph knew Old Testament Elijah and New Testament Elias were the same person. Um, one has to realize, like, it was rather common that even before the 19th century, um, Elias uh, was used as a, to denote sometimes a forerunner, not simply Old Testament Elijah or to use it of John the Baptist. Uh, one well-known example is like Alexander Campbell, who referred to like uh, an Elias of um, a false Jewish prophet in the medieval period. He's forerunner and so forth. But there's loads of other examples, and I've discussed a lot of them on my blog. If you're just typing Elias forerunner, I've been documenting them. Um, but even in the JST, uh, page 106 of Manuscript 2, Folio 1, um, he it is of whom I bear record, he is that prophet, even Elias, who coming after me is preferred before me. That's John the Baptist speaking about Jesus. So are we taking this kind of Richard Packham, Sandra Tanner approach? Does that mean that Joseph Smith actually taught Jesus was actually Old Testament Elijah or Elias? No. Again, he was using it to denote a forerunner. And how do we know that Joseph himself knew that Old Testament Elijah and New Testament Elias were the same person? You see this, for instance, in section 35, verse 4. Uh, thou art blessed, for thou shalt do great things. Behold, thou wast sent forth, even as John the Baptist, to prepare the way before me and before Elijah, which should come, and thou knowest not. So there's association between Elijah, not something New Testament Elias, and John the Baptist in this kind of uh, terms. There's also like an article by a non Latter-day Saint. Uh, let me, uh, Stephen Davis, but I say unto you, who is Elias? Question mark in the book New Perspectives in Mormon Studies, edited by Quincy Newell. Eric Mason and Jan Ships. He's not LDS, but he basically argues that it would be absurd to claim that Cindy Rigdon, who was a very closely associated with Joseph Smith, actually would have allowed this blunder to um, appear unless, of course, it was purposeful, because Cindy Rigdon would have known Old Testament Elijah and New Testament Elias were the same person. And that Joseph Smith was also cognizant of, like, say, the difference between Old Testament and New Testament names to knowing the same person. You see this where he updates the language of the a JST New Testament, like it's not it's not Hosea in many cases. It's actually Hosea, it's not Isaiah, it's Isaiah, and so on and so forth. Again, I've documented this in my blog. Um, you know, so just typing now uh, JST and Isaiah or what have you. So again, this is like really really superficial. Uh, in the chat, I'm going to share my article where I respond to Richard Packham on this point. Uh, it's called Elias as a Forerunner in LDS Scripture, but um, yeah, I just share it in the chat. 
but there are so many problems with this. And I know like Mike from LDS discussions using an absolute dolt kind of harps on this one as well. So it's pretty popular, but you know, I'll happily debate anyone on this particular point. Joe Smith did not blunder. You know, he was just using the language of his time. Now that kind of begs the question, who was the Eliza section 110? Percy, I think it's Noah based on section 27. Some like, um, Oh, Don Bradley, for instance, thinking maybe John the Baptist, Kevin Burney is also of that perspective. But be that as made, like, again, it was very common in the 19th century and even beforehand for New Testament Elias to note a forerunner, not simply John the Baptist or Old Testament Elijah. And there's even evidence from Joseph Smith's writings, the JST, Doctrine and Covenants itself, and also uh, other sources that would um, attest to this. So, yeah, there's, there, yeah, there's loads of problems. Yeah, and the unfortunate reality is that Bill does not address any of them, period. And there are, I remember reading in your book, I believe there are a couple of instances where you cite, like the, was it DNC 27 that you mentioned? Yeah, 27, 77, 110 actually have the uh, Elias issue. Right. And the more that you think about this issue, the more it begins to realize that Bill's point here doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Because as you mentioned, he just, Joseph had already done the Joseph Smith translation. Right, so he is he is fully aware of kind of the language differences, at least between, or at least he should be between Elias and Elijah, especially with Cindy Rigdon next to him. Yeah. Exactly, and so I I have a hard time believing that this was a blunder, and I remember reading your book because that was where I first introduced to your thoughts on this and thinking well, that makes a lot of sense and that reconciles a couple of things I'd I'd wondered about but needed like proof for, and so. I um I think that this is kind of interesting, but I I am a little disappointed here that Bill doesn't do a better job of, um, kind of pointing out what the different perspectives on this are, and he um I I think it would it would do him a lot of good to kind of engage with you on this, um, that 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 I think that would be rather fun. I would I would be interested to see him and you debate on that. I don't think he does debates though. Like I. He, he'll, he, didn't, he'll, he didn't do well against Jacob Hansen in their dialogues. No, he didn't. And I um I remember listening to his his first episode with Jacob and thinking this is this is a nightmare for Bill. And what Bill ended up having to do later on is he actually had to draft these topics in to try and slow Jacob down. And so I uh I thought it was kind of interesting that if I, I would wonder what it would be like if if Jacob and I, for instance, were to sit down with Bill and between the two of us, we could like help kind of answer some of these things for him. I, I'd be curious to see if he would be open for that. But he, he could bring RFM on, too, if he if he wants. And while I, I, I don't claim to agree with Jacob Hansen on everything, I I do think that he does. A, he does a decent job, at least. He's a, to try yeah, he's a pretty civil. good debater. You have to yeah. Give him that. yeah, I am. Um, I'll give credit where credit is due when it comes to Jacob. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. but we'll keep going though. Ah, uh, yes. Complaint number 93. Joseph stated that Moroni instructed him to bring Alvin with him in order to retrieve the plates. Over the course of the next year, Alvin dies, seemingly pointing to Moroni being unaware of how such would unfold. It then begs the question, is it not logical to assume that God himself instructed Moroni to instruct Joseph of the need and requirement to bring Alvin? I have found that the best answer to this comes from kind of an acknowledgement of open theism, wherein we have Joseph Smith is given a commandment, but Alvin, through the, the course of his choices, because it's my understanding that Alvin died of mercury poisoning. And so he he had gotten sick and he had taken some mercury to try and make himself feel better. Uh, that was a common medical prescription at the time, and as a result... Alvin ends up dying shortly thereafter. Uh, when we understand this as a commandment and the idea that commandments are, of course, conditional on the people doing what they're supposed to be doing, I, I don't find this to be very much of a problem, but I'd be interested to hear your take on this. Yeah, um, I think maybe like second only to Blake Oster. Um, I'm probably the LDS apologist who's like mostly active in trying to like um, convince people of open theism because it's a view I've been, I've held to for like, almost 20 years now. Um, but that's basically the view, like, although God has perfect knowledge of the future and the current present, um, God has contingent knowledge of the future, which also means he's out, He's not completely outside of time, though his experience of time is different than ours. I like to call it super time. Um, Bill seems to impute, like, uh, omniscience to, like, Moroni, which is kind of uh, problematic, you know, um, 
but like let's just say for the sake of argument the commandment that she came from god um that god actually has knowledge of like say all the counterfactuals like things that could have happened or could happen you see this like in another revelation that deals with alvin and that's basically section 137 where even before the revelation let's say uh salvation of the dead joseph sees like his parents who are still alive at the time in the celestial kingdom but he also sees alvin in the celestial kingdom and what does the lord tell joseph you know you know um basically to summarize like god will judge people based on how they would have received the gospel if they actually lived to actually receive it or what have you so that's like god actually has also counterfactual knowledge of events like events that could have happened but did not happen because other contingencies interrupted that and you see this also in the bible where like jesus says like where he visits various cities and so like if x had happened why would have been the case and so on and so forth you know this kind of counterfactual knowledge so i will grant like um among many of the Latter day saints there's this very mainstream classical theistic perspective if you will on god's omniscience in this relationship at the time i think that's very problematic if you believe even spirit is matter um, you know, uh, and I do believe, like, say, careful exegesis of the texts would lend oneself to some type of open theistic perspective in the future. So if that's what's going on here, um, you know, I'm not, it's not problematic. Right. And I, um, granted, there are a couple of people who are, who are in our circles that might disagree with that. I know Tarek of the Core happens to be one of them. He, um, if you, you're more than welcome to take a look at his stuff, I tend to lean more towards the open theism aspect. I find those answers more compelling. I, I'm sure, like, say, maybe someone who would hold, like, say, a traditional view, not necessarily like a deterministic view that Turk would hold, who would be God knew this, but he was still trying to like bring out fate in Alvin until he died. And, you know, um, also like he, how they would argue, and I think it's there's a way to argue uh, that God something has in foreknowledge of events does not in it itself mean that it's fated in the fatalistic or hard deterministic way. I think there's problems with that, but you know, I could see like someone maybe trying to get around that, but that would be like the traditional model. Right. And that, hold on, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate here for you a second. Cause I've thought about this too. The, um, so how would you then talk about specific prophecies like what we find in 2 Nephi 3? We've read that recently in Book of Mormon Studies. About uh, the name so, of the prophet being Joseph? Yeah, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't. I actually have an article on this on my blog, but uh, based on oh. my views, like, I don't believe prophecies always God looking down the corridors of time and him, like, uh, always, like, um, getting snake's eyes or double sixes or whatever the good one for gambling is. I believe sometimes prophecies more, sometimes... God promising to interact and intervene in history to show his omniscience and his power, if you will. Because what's more uh, what's more uh, potent, if you will, a God who can only simply look down the corridors of time and sometime he, and for some reason he can actually just predict this, or a God who promises to interact in the future to bring about his will. So I would say the latter, and that's how I read like Second Nephi tree for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, the Smith family were very spiritual, and like you have a very good parallel, like say how names of people um, are brought about through divine revelation, like Christ's name, like he's his parents are basically instructed, uh, you will call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins in Matthew 1. You also have a very cool example in Luke 1 with the name of John the Baptist, where no one was actually expecting him to be called John until like God basically struck his father dumb and basically instructed him to call the child John. So I kind of see this perhaps been the case when it comes to the naming conventions of Joseph Smith Sr. and Joseph Smith Jr. It could have been like, say, true divine revelation or true visionary dreams or true some type of other providence in the time. You also see this, you also see like a, um, a backup plan or a backup family with the Joseph Smith Knight family where like the father was called Joseph, the son was called Joseph, and they were known as the second family of the restoration. So my view, and I, I know Dan Peterson also holds this view, is like if something were to have happened to the Smith family, God's plan would not have been up the crapper. He would have still had a contingency backup family and backup plan when it came to the Knight family as well, because they actually had the same naming convention of their uh, children as well. So that's how I would view like Second Nephi tree. Yeah, and that that's actually really insightful. I have to take a look at that because I I know that sometimes a, a common or I imagine that a common criticism to open theism would be the idea that it looks from the scriptures that like there are some hard deterministic prophecies that occur. But I think that as you study uh, as you study the scriptures more carefully and as you think about these topics, not only is it more spiritually fulfilling, at least in my view, to hold to a more idea uh, to a more open theism idea, 
but I think it also, um, I think it also helps resolve a lot of questions people may have about kind of the nature of God's knowledge, and it blows complaints like this completely out of the water. And it's, I, I, I think it's a really, it's a valuable, it is a valuable idea. I certainly would recommend that your viewers either take a look at Blake Osler's work, also your work talking about open theism. Yeah. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll keep going because I believe we get to move into this. So I mentioned earlier that there is a, now, now granted, this this might be, this, I, I don't mean to be rude when I say this, but these are, I, I really struggle to see what Bill was thinking when he was writing these things out. These are basically idea and Landerjurism type of arguments. For, they, they might as well be. I, I am, um, let, let me just give an example of this. So these are examples I've found where Bill says something that, literally the sources he cite state the exact opposite so for example shiz is a book of mormon combatant that had his head cut off and still raised up and it came to pass that after cory antimer had smitten off the head of shiz that shiz raised up on his hands and fell and after he had struggled for breath he died bill claims this is medically and scientifically impossible and then he cites a source to do this but if we actually follow the source we actually end up seeing that um, it's actually quite the opposite. Where we have Dr. M. Gary Hadfield, who is a professor of pathology and neuropathology at the Medical College of Virginia, or at least he was at back in, um, he wrote in 1993 that due to the specific kind of um, attack that may have occurred, that this sort of reaction from shiz is very, very possible. And I've confirmed this with other kind of medical buddies of mine I um I, I, I have it's called decerberate rigidity. I'm not, probably butchering the uh, pronunciation, but yeah, it, it's all right. But basically, the long and the short of it is that this is absolutely possible, and the fact that Bill cites this as alleged evidence for the idea that that um the Book of Mormon couldn't be true, it demonstrates to me that he hasn't studied this very thoroughly, and he didn't read the source that he cited. And so I, I find that to be problematic for someone who's trying to set himself up as an intellectual authority on church <laughs> matters, and also someone who's trying to find ways to prompt critical thinking. And also, be, uh, the Book of Mormon purports to be like, say, a pre-critical pre era historical text as well. So like, how would an ancient person have described, again, using the language of appearances or the language of feminology, this? They would have basically saw like their hands move up to their severed neck, if you will, or severed head, and looked like just again the language appearances that were given the motions of someone who were like struggling for breath so again uh once one like takes a step back and realizes what type of text the book of mormon is it's a 19th century translation of an ancient text and like ancient people would have like been in critical times they were not known about like the uh some of the aspects of anatomy that hadfield discussed in his 1993 article and so forth and like again the idea of feminology the language appearances it's it's not a blunder, you know, and again, this is pretty disingenuous use of sources. It's like, it's like Michael Quinn trying to pat his footnotes, you know, to try to give the indication like his pint is being made when it comes to certain very questionable sources. Again, this is worse because this source actually flatly contradicts the, the claim this is like an impossibility and so forth, you know. And the unfortunate reality is that we get a few, at least a few of instances where Bill does this. And we're going to go over a couple of these, uh, a couple more of them. Um, this is another yeah, just, one. Just imagine if, like, he caught an LDS apologist like Brian Hills doing this. You know, it would be a wet dream for him. Yeah, um, it, it's unfortunate. I I don't know if Bill knew that this was happened. Maybe he just didn't read it very carefully. But again, even if we were to give try and give him the benefit of the doubt that this is that this is a mistake, I I then begin to have serious concerns about how well he's actually analyzing the other sources he's trying to, to bring up. So this is another good example. Um, complaint number 25 is, why does the church claim that the inspired version of the Bible, that's the Joseph Smith translation, is a restoration of the corrupted and lost parts of the Bible, and yet BYU itself acknowledges that much of the inspired translation of the Bible is a plagiarism from Adam Clark's Bible commentary, a popular contemporary source to Joseph Smith's day. So... Bill's again bringing a couple of presuppositions to the table about kind of what it means, what the Joseph, uh, what the Joseph Smith translation is. Um, he doesn't cite his source where the church claims that it is a full and complete. This is what the Bible absolutely is, perfect, one hundred ten percent. 
Um, he, he doesn't cite that. I'm, I'm sure that if you looked hard enough, you might have some leaders that might have said, stated that to an effect. But at least for the term that I have known about it, and maybe you might have some comments about this too with you being a convert, I, I, I would like to say that both of us kind of knew what the inspired translation was, and we certainly are no under obligation to believe that it is a um, the Joseph Smith translation is, by extension, a uh, completely perfect 110%. This is all the lost stuff that was that was found, that sort of thing. I um, I don't think Joseph Smith claimed that. I could no, be mistaken. Even near the end of his life, like he was making changes to the Bible, that's not reflected in the JST manuscripts. You know, like that's some that's the, a good point. Some, some, like in the um, his deconstruction, if you will, of Genesis one one is not reflective in the JST, for instance. No, that's that's a good point. I forgot about the the little note that he's he's he worked on it throughout his life. So if he really did believe that it was done, that doesn't explain why he continued to work on it. I think the explanation of the JST being a an inspired commentary, I think, is one of the best ways to describe it. I um, but I I put this little orange box here to kind of demonstrate this idea where he he claims he cites the. Uh, the way into the mountain. The way, yes, he, he cites that study. But within the study itself, again, we have this being directly contradicted. And um, wherein the authors state that in attempting to simplify what was a very complicated process, it is apparent that Clark was not utilized for the long emendations. It is more likely that Clark provided grammatical, historical, and linguistic aid to Smith as he carried out his work. So again, challenging the idea of what Bill said earlier about um the Adam Clark commentary being used just to copy paste and create the Joseph Smith translation. And even if we were to take, um, even if we were to take them at their word here, we, we do have a really good article from Ken P. Jackson uh, published in the interpreter journal, basically challenging this idea. So certainly we're under no obligation there as we study the data, there's certainly no reason that there are lots of good reasons to question whether or not those parallels are strong enough to connect uh the adam clark commentary with uh with uh the joseph smith translation okay good i did put that in there i was a little concerned but um in the study done by waymond and lemon uh we have 200 to 300 total alleged parallels being put in there but when we run the numbers on that even if we were to take all of them for what it's worth and like take that at face value, just fully accept that those are uh, plagiarisms. I, I don't think they are, but even if we were to take it at their word and say that that's still less than 10% of all those alleged, um, all, all those alleged connections, once again, challenging Bill's assumption that these, that the Adam Clark commentary provided much or most of the, changes found within JST. So yeah. again, yeah, I mean, uh, I read the articles, um, you know, uh, women study in the lemon article he did as well. And uh, I think Jackson for the most part, I think Jackson stretched here and there, but overall, I think he kind of showed like, there's no need to claim that there's a dependency upon Adam Clark. I, I do think like um, women does have a point when it comes to say the transliteration of Ramin um, in Isaiah. But there's a few teens here and there. But uh, again, like Jackson, you know, in the Pearl Grey Price um, encyclopedia that came out from Deseret only a few years before this article, he, he was base, basing it on like some of the uh, pre-published work of uh, Wayment on this issue. He said, it's possible and it should not be an issue. And I'm basically paraphrasing from memory. If, the JS, if Joseph Smith used um, available sources in his JST work, you know, and I do believe like Cindy Regan would have been familiar with the Adam Clark uh, commentary. It's like, um, that was you know, too. how if someone like in this modern era would be familiar, at least in passing, would say the Anchor Yale commentary or the word biblical commentary or something like that. But I do believe like, say, Wayman and Lemon um, over-exaggerate the po potential influence of the Adam Clark um, commentary anyway on the JST. And also it doesn't actually explain some of the really cool ancient um traditions that parallel a lot in substantial ways the some of the amendments to the jst or like how modern scholarship like in james 2 19 follows the jst um for those who want some examples like on my article responding to christina darlington on evans for the jst if you want some um real life examples so 
yeah, there's there's problems with this game, but it seems so compelling. Like, you know, the JST is just plagiarized, you know, and it's it's absolute bollocks, as the English would say. But this argument is like, a, again, it does seem like a gish gallop, like, say, what young creationists engage in, because it kind of ex because, like, the amount of confidence that's said in this kind of comment, you know, it's a very confident claim, you know, like, you know, it's, it's plagiarized. Well, let's just go back here for a second. Let's look at that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, That's... much of the inspired translation of the Bible is a plagiarism from Adam Clark's Bible commentary, a popular commentary, uh, country source to uh, Joseph Smith's day. You know, um, again, so much confidence, but like once you actually dig be beneath it, you know, um, you know, and I've read like a number of the volumes of the Adam Clark uh, commentary myself, and I've gone through like, say, the original handwritten text of the JST, you know, um, that's available um, on that DVD that came out a few years ago, now on the Joseph Smith papers. Um, it's a stretch, and I do believe, for the most part, Jackson is correct. You know, if I were to like grade his response, it's like it's a very high B in terms of a um, response to the um, work of Weymouth and uh, Lemon. Yeah, and I um I, I remember reading over both of these and thinking to myself, "There's there's evidence for both." I, I there with just like with all kind of scholarship stuff, a lot of it does boil down to kind of who do you choose to believe based on the arguments that are presented. And even if we were to, um, I, I believe uh, Wayman is a professor at BYU. Yeah. He talks about this idea. He's like, listen, this this shouldn't cause a problem for faith. He doesn't view it that way. He views it as kind of Joseph as a hypothetically interacting with the world around him as a way to help clarify things that God was telling him to clarify. And he doesn't believe it's plagiarism or he, he doesn't think that that's a good way to describe it. I could be misremembering that, but I think he was interviewed about that and where he, he kind of talked about that. It's been um, a while since I've raised the articles, but he was much more balanced than Bill Real was. But even in like, I'm not aware of like any LDS scholar like uh, who has commented on the JST from uh, a faithful perspective. Kevin Barney, for instance, or Ken P. Jackson before he, the, the work was published, as another example, who would actually have an issue with Joseph Smith using the best biblical scholarship of his time when he's interacting with the King James. Now, if he had this very naive view, like, the entirety of the JST was done under inspiration. Uh, again, it's that would be like a presupposition I would call into the question. You know, right. um, m my own view of the JST is basically it's a um, it's a mix of various things. There's some things that are inspired, like the Book of Moses and the um, Genesis section, and perhaps some of the Melchizedek material. Sometimes it shows an armed with new revelation, adding new things to the text or trying to clarify things, like the addition of telestial to one Corinthians fifteen after section seventy six. And a host of other things as well. So, you know, like uh, just as textual criticism should be done on a text by text basis, I think when it comes to the JST and trying to understand what's going on, it should be on a text by text basis as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I just I agree with that, and I I certainly would have no problem with Joseph Smith using it. Um, like I said, there's evidence for both ways, but even if we were to concede that point, I fail to see how it challenges faith in a significant way. I um, Bill would still need to demonstrate that, and I, 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 I don't think his complaint adequately accounts for all the information. It, but, it seems like you know these arguments are like addressed, to like say someone who had like a very black and white, lowercase f fundamentalist and very naive anti-intellectual approach to these issues, you know, and perhaps like he's emoting here you know perhaps because i'm not sure uh perhaps he at one stage actually had this worldview or thinks you have to believe in this kind of um these very flawed presuppositions to be faithful latter-day saint i would just say like that's absolute nonsense but you know. yeah and I, I i've wondered that myself i i've wondered if um I've heard stories of people when they leave the church, they feel like they've gotten burned because they've had their worldview challenged and then proceed to fully adopt another worldview as a response to try and almost in an attempt to overcorrect then their presuppositions that they held earlier being wrong. I believe it's um we've had we've had lots of people. I I, I think most clearly of Dan Peterson who's talked about this idea that um fundamentalist assumptions with the lowercase f as as you've clarified can really lead people to kind of disappointment. And when we look at the data more holistically, when we try to understand the context that Joseph was living, the context behind which the Book of Mormon was translated, and by extension, the, the inspired version of the Bible was translated, I, I think that there's, there's certainly not any necessity to lose faith. 
and that that it, it makes me feel sad when I see arguments like this because I I, I feel it's it, to an extent it's unnecessary. That might just be me though, and I might be overstepping my case there, but that's th those are my kind of thoughts on it. We'll keep going. This is another interesting one. Um, complete twenty six. Where he says it's it's a, he cites this as being illogical that the sun receives its light from the revolutions of Kolob. Um, he cites facsimile two, uh, where it says the sun borrows its light from Kolob through the mediums of Kai E Van Rush, which is the grand key, or in other words, the governing power which governs the fifteen or fifteen other fixed planets or stars, also the fluids of the moon, the earth and the sun, and their annual revolutions. It's as if God only comprehends the universe in a limited way that would be similar to how Joseph Smith comprehended the universe in ways that completely contradict modern science and understanding. I um, I have a hard time with that because I don't find a lot of evidence that Joseph Smith embraced this idea. And I've, I've, I've put like a little orange square around the sun there for a reason because I remember reading that and thinking, uh-oh, there's an ellipse. I better go back and see what the full text says. But before we get there, I think it's worth mentioning that Bill cites two sources here. You can kind of see them. I've, I've kept the hyperlinks there, but they actually go to the same source. So Bill is kind of, it, it looked a little weird because he's patting the, his footnotes. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell you why I, I, I really hesitate to describe motive, but that, that seems very, very suspicious to me. And I, I just str I struggle to see why. But even if we were to ignore that, because may maybe mistakes are made, um, if we go to the original document, uh, it is said by the Egyptians to be the sun. It is not necessarily that God believes that it is the sun. It is believed by the Egyptians. And that seems like an important distinction to make, because this isn't Joseph Smith describing this as his beliefs or God's beliefs or even Abraham's beliefs. When, he, when he's talking about this, um, this is just described to the Egyptians. And I feel like that if he had just gone back and read those last, that last little clarifying statement, most of this argument basically falls apart. And, but interestingly enough, though, this is actually one of the few things, or I shouldn't say one of the few things, but um, this is one of the things that's cited by a lot of uh, Pearl of Great Price scholarship as being one of the legitimate aspects of the Book of Abraham. Or uh, the, I should clarify my point here because I, I worry I don't want to be misunderstood. It's This is one of the things found within the translation of the facsimiles that seems to be corroborated by modern Egyptological scholarship. Where we have figure five, which is where Bill is getting this information from, uh, being associated by modern Egyptologists as being for the goddess Hathor. Um, the the Egyptian goddess Hathor being associated with the sun. And if we jump back over to facsimile to figure five, the connection between Hathor and the sun is also uh, um, pretty accurately and full, uh, pretty accurately, or at least pretty closely resembles what we find. So that is Joseph Smith and modern Egyptological studies seem to both indicate that this figure is related to the sun. So that, that was kind of interesting. He picked one of the figures that is attested to. Granted, Book of Mormon, uh, Book of Abraham scholarship is a whole different beast altogether. I, I tend to lean more on catalyst theory, in my opinion, with some very important caveats. I, uh, I don't think that Joseph Smith was purposefully trying to translate the Book of Abraham in a way that modern scholars would try to translate it. I um, the more can be said about that. I go more into that in my in my fuller response that I'm hoping to publish here soon. But that I just thought that that was kind of interesting. But the long and the short of it is that I don't think Bill was fully comprehending what he was writing when he was writing that complaint. If that makes sense. Yeah, as as you noted, like um. The interpretation is as said by the Egyptians. You know, if I were to say, like, uh, the Canaanites believed in Baal and Asherah, that's not me affirming by my beliefs. I'm just giving a description of a different group of people and what they believe, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the use of ep uh, ellipses, you know, um, that does strike me as being very deliberate because it's not 
again, just like the next few words, my dude, you would have seen the important qualification that kind of um, blows us out of the water. Mm -hmm. And granted, it might not, not have been directly in the parenthesis. Uh, hold on, let's just go back a little. So we have the sun right there. And we, we also talk about, um, if we read it, maybe the 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 phrase ended said by the Egyptians isn't in the ellipse itself, but it certainly is before it, just barely. And so even if we were to um, give grace to the idea that he's not hiding things through the ellipse, he certainly isn't citing the important contextual information, which I think is rather important. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll keep going here. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, Moroni imposed that the plates were golden material. This imposition is compounded by Moroni's concern that the Joseph would use the plates for financial gain. Um, the specific gravity of gold is about 17. A cubic foot of it would weigh 17 times 62 pounds. That a cubic foot of water weighs about 1,054 pounds. Half a cubic foot would weigh more than 500 pounds, more than most grand pianos. A weight impossible to carry. Apologists dismiss this issue by suggesting the plates weren't gold, but such ignores pardon me, um, the two impositions together at the beginning of this point. So, first off, most of this argument is fundamentally unnecessary, period. Um, his whole thing about launching into specific gravity of gold is just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. He's not actually proposing a specific weight the plates would be. It's just like, it would be the equivalent of me saying, um, what's a good analogy? It's, I feel I'm at a loss of an analogy that would be useful, but it's like me bringing up like something completely irrelevant to the point. And he doesn't, he doesn't tie it together very well. Uh, the sources he cites are actually as um, MRM. I believe he cite, he does cite Bill McKeever. Bill McKeever is a freaking idiot. <laughs> Um, but why not bring up like Bill McKeever's actual argument where the plates didn't weigh 1,054 pounds or 500 pounds? At most, Bill says that the uh, Bill McKeever, I should say, because there are two bills, the tale of two bills. Um, someone please make a book of that. I would love to read it. Uh, the uh, Bill McKeever states that they're at most 200 pounds. Um, now, granted, as LDS scholars have gone back over that number and say, no, if we account for like dead space in between there, if we account for the testimonies of the witnesses, again, Mormoner. Mormoner has a really great article about the Book of Mormon plates, their weight, people who said that they saw them, people who have them. Even the fact like some claim that there was like a blackish hue on some of the uh, plates, which would be consistent with like say Tambaga taking a hish or a character's being engraved right. in Tambaga. I mean, um, Neil Rapoli has an excellent presentation that well, um, you were there like um, in September of last year doing the uh, Fairies Book of Mormon presentations. I think that's going to be published as a book with the other articles. Jerry Grover, he's work uh, on Ziff, which is available for free on his website, but also his presentation on my um, channel a couple of months ago where he addressed this particular issue as well. Um, again, Bill is trying to sound very intellectual when the history goes against him because Moore and I never said they were pure gold. They said they were golden. And Tumbaga is of a gold composition. Yeah, Rinpun gold plates. Um, so, Yeah, and there's there's no indication from the text themselves. And we can even go back to the testimony of the eight witnesses as well, which says pretty much the same thing. They have the appearance of gold. So granted, Moroni never says that they are the that they are made of pure gold, period. And the fact that the witnesses were able to lift it suggests that they were not made of pure gold, period. Yeah. And so I, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we have several people claiming that they saw gold plates and people claiming that they lifted said gold plates. And what's rather interesting, like the work of Neil and Jerry and others, where the area is maybe between 40 to 60 pounds, is consistent with the descriptions of the witnesses and to be fair like maybe none of these witnesses actually knew they would probably never have heard of tumbaca or anything like that and they would have just seen the color and would have just assumed it's gold without like because they weren't metallurgists you know right. um, um but again I, I there's, there's loads of problems with it but yeah uh, you might i vaguely remember one source from john whitmer saying something that he believed that it was fully gold 
but it's a secondhand source. It's kind of late. I'm not quite sure how much stock I should put into it. Yeah, and even um, if it's firsthand, again, um, the other people around him could have dish, you know. So, right. again, he, he would be a witness only in so far as, like, their physical reality, not their um, metallurgical composition. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I go back to this idea that Bill doesn't seem to be accounting for all of the information. He is making assumptions about the text that he is not justified, and he is not accounting for what the witnesses actually state. And I, I have a hard time with that. I, I feel like that if we're, to, again, to be engaging in this idea of critical thinking, which is the point of what Bill's allegedly trying to do, that this is, this is the sort of thing that you should be willing to address. This is the sort of thing you should cite. And I, I don't think he's done the legwork in this, and I would appreciate it if he did. I think his arguments would be more compelling if he did. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's me just underlining basically the same thing. Um, oh yeah, this is another one. Uh, to note that the Book of Mormon was written specifically to the Lamanites, but with no ability to distinguish between a Lamanite Native American and a non-Lamanite Native American, Mormonism is no longer able to pinpoint its specific audience and hence has abandoned its mission to share the Book of Mormon with the Lamanites, specifically, nor can they bring the Lamanites to a remembrance of their fathers. Native Americans were hardly attracted to Mormonism anyway, and so with all that, the Book of Mormon's self-designated purpose seems thwarted. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go with no, mostly because the title page of the Book of Mormon says the exact opposite of what Bill is claiming. Uh, it said it is written to the descendants of the Lamanites as well as to Jew and Gentile. So it's just about everybody, if memory serves. And so I, I struggle to see Bill's point because the very source he is citing, again, says the exact opposite of what he's trying to claim. This is something I've known, and I. This is I'm. This is something I've known for years, and it was funny because I I've, I mentioned to you before. I've shown this. I've kind of given sneak peeks of this sort of thing to my my friends. One of the one of which is actually Native American, and she was out early days like, wait, no, the Book of Mormon doesn't say that. It's to everybody. And I am, um, I certainly have no qualms with the idea that. The Book of Mormon is trying to talk to everybody, but again, I, again, Bill's not engaging. It this this is another example. Of Bill not engaging with the text, him making assumptions and just kind of trying to make points that just don't exist and don't hold up under scrutiny. Yeah, uh, will you be addressing like the issue of like who eliminated these in this? Uh I can briefly go over that. I wasn't planning on it, but basically the um. Well, because my own view is like basically. You know, with mathematics of genealogy these days, like practically every Native American would be in some way a Lamanite. And also like Lamanite is basically, it's basically like the equivalent of the Gentile to what a Jew is. You see this, for instance, in Alameda 36. So I have no problem, like say, all Native Americans being in some way a Lamanite. But like, if you look at, say, where most people believe Book of Mormon lands to be, there's actually a huge growth uh, amongst Natives there in like, say, uh, Guatemala and Mexico and other places as well. So the claim that you know, it's not fulfilling its mission to the Lamanites. You know, um, again, as the British would say, it's bollocks. I um, there's also interesting discussions to be made uh, made about exonyms, that sort of thing. Where if we go back over, um, Michael Ash talks about this. He talked about this in the last fair conference. Um, where the Nephites could have just been calling the Lamanites Lamanites because they disagreed with them or were different, yeah. but the Lamanites could be calling themselves something different. Yeah, and um, you so see this like how like Nephi and Lamanite are used like in the Book of Mormon, like in Jacob One, it's a generic reference. It's basically if you're not with us, you're a Lamanite. And like in Fort Nephi, when there's ites again, it's basically those who are believers in the New Covenant, they're Nephites, and anyone who's not a believer in the New Covenant in Christ, they're Lamanites. Again, it, and people becoming Lamanite and Nephite and vice versa. Again, uh, yeah. So and again, this is something that's been discussed for decades in the literature. Yeah. The, well, certainly while Bill was a member. Um, the, uh, granted, I, you can, you can take this information for what it's worth. No one is obligated to believe one way or the other. So for, for instance, the one we're reading the title page here, at least, um, Moroni, when he's writing this or Mormon, when he's writing this, uh, seems to be referring to Lamanites as a specific group of people to be differentiated from Jew and Gentile. So maybe it's an exonym, maybe it's not. Maybe it's referring to people who are descended from the Lamanite people, maybe it's not. 
But the fact of the matter is, is that there's multiple ways to view it. And I am, um, Bill is bringing kind of a black and white assumption. It has to be this way in order for it to be true. And again, that's an assumption. And I, I would like for him to prove said assumption before I'm, I accept the idea that I'm supposed to or obligated to believe it. So, yeah. And I, I do, and not to like, um, stress this too much but like he's a determinist so like we're just basically like um groups of molecules uh, where molecules bouncing off one another so like you know there's no such thing as like truth or presuppositions in these worldview um if you just believe we're all just molecules having or molecules bounce off one another and so forth so again he's not being consistent with his worldview which can't ground even like presuppositions and truth anyway but that's a different matter even if i was to steel man that and say he's trying to attack our worldview I, I would say that I, he's not accurately representing our worldview. Yeah, that's true. And I, I, I again, that we're kind of beating a dead horse at this point, but it's, um, or dead tape here, depending on how you view it. Um, we'll, we'll keep going, but I, I think that we, we've got most of it. Oh yeah, this is another interesting one. Uh, it's riddled with sarcasm, though, as you, as you can kind of see. It's Bill says that when Lehi and company were lost in the wilderness, instead of guiding them by revelation using a still small voice to his prophet, God went in secret, sent them to them a magical brass ball-shaped compass. So right off the bat, we are, we're loaded with just kind of the cynicism, the sarcasm. Secret Santa does not seem like it's, it's a little weird. Um, by the way, I know we'll be covering this, but like um, this secret Santa object, it worked through faith. Correct. It, it, it worked through revelation. So again, uh, but this compass didn't use magnetic poles, the sun, the sky, or the stars. It pointed the way when there was enough faith wafting through the air. Wafting is that's a word i guess um to he, power his wife probably gave him like a uh, word of a day calendar and that was wafting was the uh, word when he wrote this um i i have no clue what what his, his his um his intention is there he might just be trying to be as cynical as possible he might just be trying to put words in to make himself sound smarter it, it might just be because he thought that was the best word to describe it i couldn't tell you I'm well, not he, Bill, he would but, fail on all three counts. Um, as, as we'll soon see, I don't think his points hold up under scrutiny. That he, he continues by saying this Liahona was said to have been found in the same box as the gold plates, and yet no one ever saw it. So that's that's an important thing that that, that we'll come to here in a second. It's not known why Joseph, why God didn't just use the Liahona to provide written translations and instructions to Smith, and instead allowed Joseph to use his treasure digging peepstone. Also noting how similar the Liahona was to 19th century stage coach candle warmer. <laughs> um, uh, we'll, we'll get to that here in a second because by the, I, by the way, um, yeah. this is this is in the context of the Arabian Peninsula geography. So like Vogel and others can cope and siege, but um we actually do have like demonstrable historical evidence for Book of Mormon based on this historical narrative of first Nephi. So um, this is just really pathetic, you know, to um, as an as an argument. But yeah, go ahead. No, I, I I'm unfortunately I'm I'm inclined to agree with you. I don't find this argument very compelling, um, for a couple of different reasons. So first, it's making some you know the cynical nature I I find to be, um, not conducive to critical thinking. It, it, I, I just it, he's you can tell he's not taking this very seriously he's just trying to cause um, he's just trying as he said earlier the whole point of this is to cause people to question whether or not they can they can actually have a testimony in good conscience so it is to his benefit for that mission to make this sound as ridiculous as possible he's trying to make this sound unbelievable and that the faithful perspective is irrational or and or riddled with conjecture that is you know, you know what this actually reminds me of it's like that website where they kind of give like these summaries of movies but like it's the worst it, it it's the worst case um you know um summary of a movie you know where it kind of makes like a disney movie like like dark you know like a oh yeah he's kidnapped by like seven door uh seven seven um men or something like that you know and stuff like that it's like yeah yes but no yeah it's um I, I don't I don't think it's accounting for the information in any way that reflects our worldview or what the text actually says. 
-hmm. or what people actually said. As we'll soon see, we have John Whitmer and we have David Whitmer affirming the idea that at least the three the three witnesses actually did see the Leah. Yeah. And I believe that sort of thing is also attested to in the Doctrine and Covenants. Yeah, um, section 17. Yes. And, and so, by the way, for those who are wondering, like the Leo, that was often called the director's ally, um, the text of Alma 37. So that's why, um, but also the ball is mentioned as well. Um, there's like yeah, a text uh, referring to Alma 37. Yeah, Joseph Smith Papers talks about how the ball and the directors are basically the same thing. So that's, that's the fact that they are differentiating between those, that there's a comma between them should not indicate that those are two separate things. The ball is understood to be the directors, is my understanding. Um but again, here are two records coming from different time periods, coming by people who... Uh, so John Wimmer, I believe that that one, that's an 1830s record. So John David Wimmer and the witnesses were clearly talking about them seeing the Liahona at least at that time. And David Wimmer affirmed that he saw the Liahona multiple times throughout his life. Yeah. And so I, I have a hard time taking Bill at his word when he says that David Wimmer is just making this up or that no one actually saw the Liahona. And of course, it should be noted, like unlike the other two witnesses, uh, Whitmer never came back to the mainstream LDS church, and he was very critical of Joseph Smith, as seen in these 1887 address to all believers in Christ. And yet, like all throughout the opening few dozen pages of that critical work, is like Book of Mormon true. I saw the plates, you know, uh, cope and seat critics. Um, Thank you for bringing that up because I was going to mention that too. Because in in the say in some of these addresses where he's giving these interviews, he's talking about how he sees this. And then almost in the same breath, he's criticizing Joseph Smith. And it's um, my, my question at that point to be, what does David have to gain by trying to demonstrate that the plates actually existed or that he actually did see the Liahona? Because he does that throughout his entire life. And it really boils down to the fact that I think the record indicates that he at least believed he saw something. Yeah. So if, if nothing else... Even if we were to believe that Joseph Smith is just making this up on the fly, we have to take into account that Joseph at least had some kind of metal artifacts. Either the tin plate, Dan Vogel talks about tin plates. I don't know if he still holds that view. I think that he still does. Okay. Um, and it's still nonsense. He, uh, maybe by extension, he's talking, to, maybe by extension, Vogel can claim that, you know, Joseph just had like one of the, he just was able to, manufacture a Liahona looking thing. And it's um we'll talk a little bit about that here. So he he makes a comment about a 19th century hand warmer. You can see that kind of right there. You um in the inside you have like a little candle right there. Hypothetically these little uh support devices would be able to allow this uh, allow the candle to swivel so you could hold it any which way up and have your hand warm. But the thing is, that's not very much like the Liahona at all. Um, as demonstrated, I believe the work of Don Bradley warrants mentioned here. Here's this book, The Lost 116 Pages. Great book. He, he, great book. I finished it recently. It's, it's amazing. I'm very impressed with it. Um, but he actually talks about what people said the Liahona looked like. And if we go back to the historical sources, they describe this idea that on the inside, there was one spindle that would point to where they were supposed to go, corresponding with what we find in the Book of Mormon text. But then the other spindle would kind of point to a picture that kind of demonstrated that. So if we were to take what the historical witnesses are saying about the Liahona seriously, then a 19th century hand warmer isn't going to cut it. So with the way where i'm coming from from this is okay if i'm joseph smith and i'm trying to con people and i need to create artifacts that look legitimate where am i going to get a liahona that would be convincing to people so did he just like buy one of these and then like smelt it a little bit and try and like make alterations to it how would he do that where would he learn to do that where would he get the materials to do that um it's funny because when he makes Bill makes claims like this often, and they are often just as riddled with conjecture as he claims we members of the church try to employ. Yeah, and maybe it's me, but you know, I'm well read like say 19th century as well as like modern literature against the Book of Mormon and the church as a whole. Um, has anyone ever made the hand warming argument before? You know, because it seems um, like, this seems to be a novelty. You can credit RFM for that. 
Um, okay. The, uh, RFM, I believe he did a podcast with Bill Real, but he for, it, I, I'm surprised they didn't cite it in this actual one. But I was curious because I, I wanted to see if Bill actually had something on this. So I went and I watched the episode. I was actually about ready. Here's a fun little story. I was actually about ready to dismiss this as them just making it up because I actually used the pictures that RFM cited and I cross-referenced them through Google Lens and Google Images to see if I could find where they came from. And half of the examples easily were not 19th century. They were like 13th century, like incense for like Muslim, for, for Islam, incense burners. And they certainly weren't 19th century Northern. I was about to give up until I actually ended up calling a, uh, like a museum, like an antiques, like an antiques museum talking mm -hmm. about this. And they're like, yeah, there was like a little factory and, and they, they said it was in New York. Um, so while, even if you were to say though, that Joseph Smith was just making this up and that maybe he co-opted the idea of a Leona from this, there are there is a ton of intellectual legwork you still have to go through, ton of hoops you have to jump through in order to get to any kind of conclusion that Joseph Smith was able to either fabricate a Leona or find a way to trick people into believing they were seeing a Leona. And you I would imagine, don't... like, say, John Whitmer, who did leave the church, was bitter with Joseph. David Whitmer, who never returned, they would have realized, like, holy crap, it was a hand warmer to con artist, you know? I think they would have known about this, you know, but... Yeah, that, that was my thought. And nobody, I, I think it's the, I, I think the fact that critics of the church don't mention this, like, we have E.D. Howe bringing this up. Uh, E.D. Howe doesn't bring it up in, like, Mormonism Unveiled. And we, we certainly don't have other people bringing this up. Yeah, I, I struggle to see if if they didn't make the connection and they were living in a time where this sort of thing was common. I half wonder if um, there's a part of me that wonders kind of like there's a wonders why Bill takes this series. There are RFM things yeah. that this is. I mean, I do welcome when critics, you know, and I don't think like all critics are anti-Mormon. So like when a critic comes up like a good argument or something novel, you know, that is challenging, you know, but again, this, this does seem to be like a lot of coping and seeding because they are familiar with, um, the rather impressive work is a Warren Aston, Neil Rapoli and others on the Arabian Peninsula geography. So they'll have to like do anything to like, try to like, um, deconstruct any of the narratives in one Nephi, especially the Arabian Peninsula narratives of which this is a part, but that's, that's maybe just me. Mm -hmm. And that's that's something I found that's rather common with uh, the Mormon Discussions podcast. They they don't they don't bring people on that they disagree with very much anymore. Um, so they'll they'll talk about you, for example, and that whole uh, what was it, <sighs> Jonathan Neville controversy? Yeah, uh, yeah. So they'll talk about you and falsely accuse me of being a racist. Yeah, and that's that was just ridiculous. Um, the. But they won't, it's, it's, I have yet to see them actually engage with your material. Or they'll talk about Nahum, but they won't actually engage with people like Neil Rapley. Or they'll talk about the Book of Abraham, but then don't talk about like the work of Stephen Smoot. Or um, even more modern stuff like uh, Michael Hubbard McKay, who, who came out with that article way back when that you posted about. I'm um, talking basically about how the you you call I like your phrase for it. It was the final nail in the coffin in the idea that the Book of Abraham came from the Gale. Yeah, uh, it's just it just doesn't hold up. And I I was suspicious about that for a long time because as I read over the papyrus and I read over the Gale, I thought that I would have seen very different things about if we were trying to prove that the Book of Abraham came from the Gale, but. It was nice to be validated a little bit later because on my mission, when you I, I served in the Dominican Republic, I couldn't access it to stuff very well. So I basically had to keep it in my heart that there was more to the story and it was nice to be validated afterwards. But um, the long and the short of it is I, I wish that Bill would engage more with stuff that we say. And I mean... We'll, we'll get to more on that in a second and I'll, I'll kind of leave my final thoughts here soon because we're wrapping up here um we have maybe five more slides but uh fallacious reasoning he talks about how two hundred thirty thousand soldiers were killed on one day near the hill Cumorah. in comparison the battle of antietam 
The bloodiest battle in American history had 3,600 casualties using modern weapons and artillery, also noting there is zero evidence of such a battle having ever taken place. Um, I have found that that is an argument from ignorance. In other words, I believe it's, I, I often call it an argument from silence. Um, it is the assumption of a conclusion or fact based primarily on the lack of evidence to the contrary, usually best described as the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because we don't know where the battle was taking place or we don't know how many people died there does not necessarily prove that it didn't happen. And so just because we can't, this is also encapsulated with a lot of stuff about Book of Mormon archaeology, just because we don't know where Zarahemla is does not mean that Zarahemla doesn't exist. My question to critics of the church, I'm like, okay, where should we start digging? Like, um, if I remember correctly, it's like less than 1% of Mesoamerica has been explored. Like, where should we start digging? And where are we going to get the, um, it, like, is the, like, how, how are we supposed to go about proving this sort of thing? Like with 100% degree of certainty, because I, 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 I struggle with arguments like these because I don't think they're accounting for how archaeology is done. Yeah. But I, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, just on the 230,000 figure when it comes to Nephi casualties, that we were told, like, say, how there were like 23 individuals and under them there were like 10 thousands. But I've often read that as a military unit, like, say, the Roman century. But a century did not always have to have 100 men. It could be depleted and it could still be referred to as a century. They could be down to 60 men and still a century. So my view is like the 10,000 figure, it does not have to be literally 10,000 men because they were fighting for like a number uh, for quite some time. They had a number of victories and number of defeats. So it could be like say a unit called 10,000, but it could have been like severely depleted at this time. So it's an assumption like say, 10,000 here refers literally to 10,000, and it's not like, say, a military unit, you know, so that's one issue. Uh, second, of course, like, this only works if you think the hill in New York, which would not be known as Camorra until, like, 1832, thereabouts, is the Book of Mormon Camorra. But if you read Mormon 6.6, all the plates need uh, Mormon deposited, you know, with the exception of the plates that would be given to Moroni, and we know he wandered, was buried in the Book of Mormon Camorra. Right. So of all the hills in the entire universe, if you will, not just America, that could not be the hill Kamara of the Book of Mormon is the Drumlin in New York where the plates were buried. You know, notwithstanding the very strong historical tradition that it was the final battle place of the Book of Mormon as well. Because like many early Latter-day Saints had this naive uh, view, although it's understandable that, you know, it's a hill, it's associated with the plates, that must be the final battle, basically. Um you know, and perhaps even Joseph Smith for a while held to that view as well. I mean, some will, I don't hold to what's called the intentionist fallacy, where the intention of a translatory author of a text is the determinative, determinative reading of a text. I mean, Joseph's understanding of the Book of Mormon uh, grew just as our understanding of the Book of Mormon grew. So there's a host of other issues. And also, yeah, um, where should we start digging? You know, if you want to take this seriously, um, you know, Sorensen and Palmer argued it was El Carovigia. The late Larry Paulson argued it was a different hill. I know Jerry Grover is he's candidate for the Hill of Kamara based on his really cool model of the Book of Mormon based on the geology. Um, so, you know, there's a debate uh, as to like where exactly is the Hill of Kamara amongst the Day Saint scholars, but like we're all more or less agreed it's somewhere in Mexico, Guatemala area, not upstate New York. Now, of course, that's going to. Um, I can uh, hear a lot some... of Heartlanders being very upset with you right now. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm friends with, like, some, like, Adam uh, Stokes, you know, um, and he's one of the more sane Heartlanders. He's he's a Heartlander based on exegesis, even if I disagree with it. But, um, yeah, I mean, cope and seed. But there you go. Yeah. So there's no, there's those of issues, like, taking, like, 10,000 as a literal figure, not, like, in military unit. Um, and that's one problem. The issue of, like, where should we be digging, you know, and what type of evidence should we expect? Because... Uh, the soil, whether it's acidic or alkaline, will like uh, decompose the uh, bodies. And also, as it seems like the weapons will still remain in the burial site or the battle site. But ancient people, you know, would have actually grabbed the weapons of their fallen uh, victims. You know, it's not because weapons and metals and precious items were like the, a rare commodity. You're not going to leave them on the battleground. You're going to pick them up and use them for yourself you know, and repurpose them for other purposes as well. So there's a number of assumptions that are faulty 
even if one thinks it's a 19th century work of fiction, you know. Um, yeah. And I, uh, I, I fully, whole, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, Robert. I, I've, I don't find a lot of Bill's arguments here super compelling. It's interesting because he actually, in another one of his complaints, I actually believe it's the very first complaint he cites. He complains about apologists trying to change the location of the Hill Camorra. Where he um he bring, he brings up like this uh this one source uh about is that the uh, secretary of the first presidency that letter that sometimes media rounds um no Crawford? it, it okay. was uh it, it was basically he was complaining about how Moroni uh, there was one source that claimed that the Moroni showed up at the place where the Manti Temple was supposed to be built. That's 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 one claim made in the history of Orson Whitney. I have that book; it's downstairs. But yeah. the um, I've heard that tradition before as well. Yeah, and that was one. But uh, unfortunately, as you as you do more digging into it, you find out that's that's um. There's a good case to be made that that didn't happen. I believe there's a non LDS historian who looked into that. She posted on her blog about it. Um, it's a, it's more it's fleshed out more in my my longer response I'm working on, but cool. the uh, the long and the short of it is there's no reason to assume that there's that the Hill Camorra described in the Book of Mormon is the Hill Camorra or the the that Drumlin Hill in New York. It's a uh, that that reading grew into popularity in the mid 1830s with Oliver Cowdery and W. W. Phelps, and it's likely that Joseph Smith picked up on that after the fact. Sure. Um, that that's my view on it. Yeah, I I would agree. But uh, there's another really good Scripture Central article that talks about it. Bill, to his credit, cites it when he talks about this complaint in complaint number four. But then he just kind of tries to brush it off and say, "Well, it's just conjecture," and I'm like. No, because they're citing non-LDS scholarship here. And they're citing like really people who are really worth their salt in terms of like whether we should take this seriously or not. So again, it's um poisoning the well in terms of trying to dismiss all apologetics and also an argument from ignorance talking about. Um just because we can't find something means it doesn't happen. But we'll we'll keep so like on the battle, the modern battle he prints up is like victims of 3,600. But like um, even from my studies of the U.S. Civil War and stuff like that, there were battles with much more casualties. So like it seems like he's trying to lowball a modern figure to like um, make the Book of Mormon even look worse, if you will. But maybe that's just me. Yeah, that there's definitely something to be said there, and I feel bad because I made a mistake here in my slide. I, I put this as an argument from ignorance when in reality this should be a non sequitur. But um, complaint 67, modern prophets stating that the way out of poverty is paying more tithing. Logically, this is completely contrary to anything rational. If true, Mormons would be the most wealthy people on the planet. Bishop storehouses would only be minimally needed. A people collectively exiting poverty by paying tithing is irrational. Um, so the problem here with Bill's logic is that I... Oh, there it is. All right, cool. All right. Um, the problem I found here is that with Bill's re reasoning here, I don't find it actually appeals to logic or reason, at least from a syllogistic standpoint. So according to Bill's logic, this is President Nelson taught that the poor people of the world have had cycles of poverty generation after generation. That same poverty continues from one generation to another until people pay their tithing. And then he just says that the conclusion here is that Mormons should be the most wealthy people on the planet, but he doesn't flesh out what he means at all. And he's, um, I, I struggle to see how President Nelson teaching about the benefits of tithing and how it can have a deep spiritual impact um, allegedly leads people to being the most wealthy people on the planet, nor do I see how just the idea of being able to get out of poverty means you're going to be the most wealthy people in the world that just that just doesn't make sense to me so i i would want bill to flesh that out more fully because i don't think the premise he supports conclusion i mean he's he's bringing up logically and reasonably reason I, I would want him to employ tactics of logic and reason to support that um here's an article done by the church back in 2018 shortly after those comments from president nelson talking about how paying tithing helps your budget your viewers can take a look at that if they wish my grandparents 
actually. One of the things they really love to be able to do is they go and they teach self-reliance missions, wherein they, they're going from place to place helping people to get out of debt, and they use gospel principles to be able to do it. And so the, to, to state that this doesn't work, I, I think, seems to be not accounting for everything. Now, granted, the point of tithing is not to get out of debt. The point of tithing is to be a, a is to, to an extent, uh, help establish a relationship with God. And it is to, it helps that I found though, it is a principle that of tithing, sorry, the principle of tithing helps us appreciate what we have as a result, because we recognize that what we have comes from God. Um, I, I have a little syllogistic structure here. You can take it for what it's worth, but uh, basically there's no reason to assume that just because people pay tithing, they are automatically going to um, just become poorer and poorer to the uh, approaching, you know, driving themselves completely destitute any more than it is reasonable to say that they will become the wealthiest people on the planet. The point of tithing is to help foster a change within ourselves we are willing to it is a preparate I, I i view it as a preparation to living the law of consecration quite frankly i always find it's odd when people complain about tithing because i think well if you don't like tithing how are you going to feel about trying to live the law of consecration where we are consecrating our time our efforts and every aspect of our being to god and the building of the kingdom for all intents and purposes and i I struggle to see where Bill's true complaint about this comes from, and I don't think he's he's thinking about this in a in a logical or reasonable way. Or at least from this complaint, I wasn't able to find anything that kind of talked about him trying to use these kinds of tools of reason and logic to help prove his point. I just it's just not there. So sometimes, like as you know, it's kind of the whole pearl clutching. You know, oh, these evil rich corporate church. You know, they want the money of these um, single mothers. You know, who are making who are barely making ends meet, or like these turtle world country members. You know, and trying to exploit them for their naivety. You know, but yeah. But ignoring the fact that the church is giving far more to said third world countries than they are ever receiving. But it's never enough for them. I. This is this is stuff that the. That even critics of the church like D. Michael Quinn have like outrightly written about. He he's called this like being some some aspect of the church that's actually faith promoting. Exactly. And he's um and that's D. Michael Quinn. <laughs> he's a uh, this is not a guy who's who's has any who has anything to gain from trying to paint the church in a positive light. Uh I just I I don't know. This is a complaint that kind of makes me, th this is a complaint that kind of rubs me the wrong way because I, having served in a place where I've seen the church do immense good for people of a lower economic class, I I struggle with this because I, I wonder how much should the church be doing? If, if you say the church should be doing more, what should you be, what should they be putting their money for? They, they donate more than most other nonprofit organizations, com you know, combined, they are actively trying. That that that's of course discounting all the the volunteer stuff that members tried to do. Um. So I I I worry that this this complaint does not tell the whole story, and so I I, I struggle with it. And for those who str um who are not exactly happy with the one hundred billion dollar fund, my response is make it a trillion. Hashtag make it a trillion. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. Let's let's if we can continue to gain more to help other people, then I am all for it. Period. Uh, last one. Uh, we have um, his discussion about homosexuality, where he writes, "Homosexuality is deemed wrong in spite of 500 species having homosexuality within their behaviors." We also know that homosexuality is epigenetic, meaning there's genetic factors showing homosexuality is linked to human development. Um, that's not what epigenetic means, but I understand what he's trying to say, but okay. Um, uh, he, he could go into a little bit more about what epigenetic actually means, but yeah. For, for certain types of finger length, of a significant increase of rate of homosexuality as well as birth order. Humans didn't invent homosexuality. Once you grasp that the behavior doesn't originate from an invisible being named Satan, 
and instead is part of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, our stances of a behavior that is evil or sin becomes ridiculous. Well, first of all, from the very first moves, um, you see the nationalistic fallacy. Just because it appears in nature does not mean it's actually good. Bingo! Yes, I won! <laughs> good job, Robert. Um, yeah, so this is, a, this is an appeal to nature, which is fallacious. Just because we find something in nature doesn't necessarily make it good. Um, I, I have to be careful with how I make this argument, because I know for a fact that some members of the church might try to do something similar in an attempt to try to show that the church's position is true. Um, let, let me think how to put this. Just because we find a specific behavior done by animals, so for example, um, Penguins have a tendency to, uh, some species of penguins can engage in some kind of homosexual behavior. It's my understanding it's a little bit different, though. I, I, I have to go back and look over it again. But there are also species of penguins that engage in necrophilia. That doesn't make necrophilia okay or a good idea. And so I, I struggle with the idea that just because we find something in nature doesn't necessarily make it true or it doesn't necessarily make it good. And Bill would need to demonstrate that nature is the highest moral authority, bef just be and that the fact that animal behaviors are the best moral authority for what we human beings should do before he can make a claim like this. And he's just he's taking, he, he, to an extent, he's begging the question that nature is the highest authority for morality anyway. And so he would, he, I, I I don't find those kinds of arguments compelling. Um, here's me pulling out my research when someone on the internet tells me I'm wrong. Uh, I've been working on this for a long time, but I'll also concede I'm 23 years old. There's, there's likely mistakes that I've made, and I certainly would have no problem with someone reaching out to me to try and correct it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is I, I struggle with a lot of what Bill has done, because as I hope I've been able to show, he has made several assumptions, he cites incomplete information, he makes fallacious arguments, he repeats his, he repeats his sources and arguments as an attempt to make it, I, I, I can't necessarily read an attempt, but it certainly gives an, it gives the impression of greater authority of arguments than what is actually there. I I struggle with the um I just I just struggle with it as a whole. And I don't find arguments like the stuff that he cites to be very compelling. It seems very gish gallopy in nature. I I I see no reason why faith needs to be abandoned because of these sorts of arguments. And you and I, I think, would both agree that as we continue to study more and as we look at these from the data from a more holistic perspective, and I would also add the caveat too, you don't have to just engage your brain with this. I mean, I, I've I've come at this from a more logistical, uh, logical kind of reason-based approach. But I mean, ultimately, I think you and I would both agree that a conviction of like the theological truth of the Book of Mormon, for instance, that would hypothetically come from the spirit. And we can't, while this sort of thing, I guess, is interesting and it's, it helps provide room for faith, this sort of thing can only be confirmed to people via the Holy Ghost. And I know that as we continue to study, we give room for the Holy Ghost to work with us so that we can eventually come to the truth. And thank you for coming to my two-hour TED Talk. Uh, well, that's uh, that was pretty informative, and I do look forward to, like, say, the uh, finished work when it's posted by Fair. Um, so, I hope to. I might not be able. I, I might not. I, I'm still gotta um, work out some of the kinks in it. I'd like to get a couple of other people kind of chiming in for this sort of thing before I fully publish it. Uh, it's pretty close to being done. I, I I hope to be able to get it here within the next couple months. I'll put it that way. But I. I don't know. This is a rather common thing that a lot of critics of the church have tried to do recently. I mean, I think of Jeremy Rundle's the CES letter. Uh, there are a couple of other documents that are trying that are trying to 
make their way through the internet first that kind of talk about the their laundry list of things that they believe are incompatible with reality in terms of the gospel um and i i won't pretend to uh, i won't pretend to claim anything that the church is perfect I, d I don't make any claims to prophetic infallibility and i don't claim any i don't claim an omniscience either but certainly a lot of the things that I think both of us have been able to discuss tonight help show that a lot of the claims that Bill makes don't hold up under scrutiny very well. Yeah, um, yeah, I would agree. I, I wasn't actually privy to the article um, or his list of questions until you kind of mentioned it, and I didn't. It's Bill Real. I don't take him seriously. I, unfortunately, some people do. So, um, well, um, I mean, I'm, he's I'm got like what twenty thousand subscribers. Yeah. So, I. And it, it breaks my heart when I see that because as as we've shown, there there a bill will sometimes say things that that just aren't supported. And he cites himself as some kind of intellectual authority when he he doesn't do things that people with actual intellectual authority, at least in my view, should do. And there's there's a reason that I think you and I both struggle with reading his content because I don't think it's a lot of the time, it's just him being snarky. It's him being selective with sources. It's it bothers me. Yeah, I mean, like um, any half decent person who's actually read the scriptures and is familiar with a very basic apologetic work, I think they could be able to like um, do a very. They wouldn't be really too bothered by this. It seems to be like a boundary ma uh, boundary maintenance, like say various counter cult groups like to engage in, you know. Um, so you won't buy say the LDS apologetic grift as they would view it or bind to LDS claims you know, from like Fair, Fair or Scripture Central or the B.H. Roberts Foundation, you can have this kind of um, really crappy um, attempt at um, boundary maintenance. So your people won't be attracted to return because many of them are ex-LDS. Hmm. But th those arguments are like really piss poor arguments. Um, so. I, uh, I, I know we're live. I don't suppose people have, have written any comments. I can't quite see them. Um, it's just like uh, one feller, like Tyler, how like um, Bill actually brought him back to the faith in 2013, and then he left, but he returned back in 2021. So, um, yeah, that, that's that's basically it. There's not been there's been no negative comments um, I, so far. I, that's fair, and I will um, I will I will give Bill credit where credit is due. If Bill wants to reach out to me, I suppose he can. But the fact that the fact that he feels like he would want to discuss these sort of things with a 23 year old as as being representative of like the cumulative apologetic work that's been done on this that i i struggle to see how that would be productive it, will, it would also be very do. bad optics if he were to lose that dialogue or discussion with you <laughs> i um i mean if you want to talk to the, if bill wants to talk about these sort of things he really should reach out to the people who studied these the most. If he wants to talk about Nahum, talk to Neil Rapley. If he wants to talk about, or, or if he wants to talk to about like the weight of the plates or whether or not like. Um, well, Jerry Grover has told me like he would be more than willing to actually have a discussion with him nor FM. Yeah. And it's not like people are actively trying to avoid them. Although I, I would say that I, I worry that because Bill has has done things in the past that that seem almost kind of like to misrepresent like what apologists actually say, that maybe apologists are like, oh, I don't want to deal with him because he's just a dishonest actor. I don't want to go as far as to say that uh, Bill is a dishonest actor. I, that, I might be in a minority opinion on that. I, I don't know him personally, but I would really like to believe from the bottom of my heart that the that the problems that we've discussed here today are they are a product of him either not studying this out carefully or him feeling like he's rushed to get through this. I I could be wrong, but I I would hope that Bill, if he hears these, would would take these complaints seriously because I think they pose serious problems to his to either his worldview or either his his goal to cause members to critically think themselves out of the church. Cool. Um, because we've been going on for a while. Um, any other any other final comments you want before we wrap things up? Um, yeah, I I personally bear no ill will to anybody who has left the church. I the only if I I know what it's like to 
to hold beliefs that are in a minority opinion and feel like nobody in your in-group like agrees with you and so you feel like you have to leave. But I start to have a problem when people start to make claims that I don't think hold up under scrutiny. And that has that that is most of my issue with what Bill is is trying to do. I I don't think there's any reason to abandon faith because of these kinds of arguments. And if someone like me can figure this stuff out, because I don't have a degree in anything, I, and if someone like me can arrive at that conclusion and try their best to hold fast to the data, I'm sure other people can find ways to look at all of this sort of stuff and come to a conclusion that we don't have to give up the faith that we, you know, that we hold dear. No, that's good. Um, so thanks again, Zach, for coming on. Um, we'll end things now, but like for those who are listening live or will listen to the repeat, um, I will have like a, a stream at 6 p.m. on Sunday where I'll discuss like my, the gospel doctrine lesson I would have taught just earlier um, on Isaiah and the Book of Mormon. And I'll throw in a few extra things as well. And if anyone wants to come on and do like a dank meme review, let me know. On the 14th of March, I'll have Chark the Core on to discuss the A and B series of time on uh, for the podcast. And the day afterwards, we will have a pre-birthday, pre-St. Patrick's Day, I'm Irish after all, uh, stream. So anyone who wants to hop on as well uh, to celebrate um, my forthcoming um, 37th birthday and or the most important uh, sacred holiday in the Irish calendar, St. Patrick's Day, you can hop on as well. So um, thanks to anyone who actually uh, listened to almost all three hours. And thanks again, for Zach, for coming on. We do look forward to like say, the uh, finished work uh, being published um, hopefully sometime this year. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm excited to hop on with you again soon as we discuss yet another critic of the church, James Wilder oh, yeah. Durbin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do plan on, like, say, watching some of your um, response to my uh, review of the Gospel for Mormons and also the Gospel for Mormons itself. And um, also was asked by Jacob Mayerberry to, like, um, maybe review some of their criticisms and Michael Heiser in another work, uh, video they did. So, yeah, we'll be doing that in um, hopefully in March, so, um, or whenever uh, we both can, but for people who are watching, that's something to look out for as well. Um, I'll probably end up tearing my hair out because, uh, um, but yeah. <laughs> but thanks again for anyone who watched this, um, who, who will watch this uh, in the repeats as well. And anyone who stuck for like almost all three hours straight, um, do appreciate it. And thanks again, Zach, and enjoy your weekend. You too, boss. Take it easy.